Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Crime Weekly. I'm Stephanie Harlow. And I'm Derek Lavasser. Before we dive into today's video, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark VPN. Both Derek and I have said it a million times before, using a VPN is something that everybody should be doing. And in our opinion, there is no better option than Surfshark VPN. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Firstly, Surfshark is a modern VPN designed with the user in mind. And if the person who is using it is like me, technologically challenged, it has to be really, really easy to use. And Surfshark is. It's designed to be incredibly simple to use, but their utilities are also powered by robust security mechanisms. And Surfshark encrypts and protects all of your data sent via the internet, including your passwords, your private messages, videos, photos, pretty much everything that you're sending over the internet. They keep everything safe from prying eyes, and they have so many features that are really beneficial for anyone who uses the internet on a regular basis, which is, you know, everybody on the planet. They have a feature called Clean Web, which blocks ads and malware before they can even load. And this does two things. First of all, nobody likes ads and malware. They're annoying and they can be dangerous, but it also helps you save on mobile data and it boosts your browsing speeds and helps you avoid phishing attempts. Surfshark also has a strict no logs policy. So most of your internet providers, they're going to keep track of what you're doing online. Not only that, but most internet service providers are required to not only log this stuff, but keep it for years. But Surfshark does not track any of your online whereabouts or actions in any way. Surfshark even has a no borders mode, which is my favorite thing. This allows you to get around inconvenient geoblocking. So geoblocking is a way that your access to the internet and certain content on the internet is limited based on where you live. But Surfshark thinks that the internet should be open to everyone, no matter who you are or where you live. So like, have you ever clicked on a YouTube video and it says, this content isn't available in your country? That's because your IP address is being used to prevent you from getting to that content. So Surfshark allows you to change Change your IP to make it look like you're somewhere else. And that gives you access to a whole bunch of content you didn't have before, not only on YouTube, but on streaming platforms like Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, and more. I always use the example that like Derek was covering Big Brother Canada on his other podcast, The Winter Circle, but he doesn't live in Canada, so he can't watch Big right. Brother Canada. So he had to change his IP to make it look like he was in Canada, and then he could watch it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Love love a VPN, especially Surfshark. You know, we're not just promoting it here. I use it every day. And the best thing about Surfshark is that you can use it on unlimited devices. That means you can put it on your cell phone, your tablets, your computers, your your wife or husband's computer, or tablet, cell phone, your kids' tablets to keep them safe, your mom's tablet, your dad's computer, all of it. It means truly unlimited. So Derek is going to tell you how you can try Surfshark out for yourself because we definitely think that everyone should use a VPN. And for us, it's always going to be Surfshark. That's right. For a limited time, get 83% off a two-year plan plus three extra months for free at surfshark.deal slash crime weekly. This special offer makes your subscription just $2.21 per month. So once again, go to surfshark.deal slash crime weekly and use our code crime weekly to protect your online privacy today. We strongly recommend you check it out. We want to thank Surfshark for sponsoring this week's episode. Let's dive into the case. So today we are continuing on with the Aaron Hernandez series. We are on part three. But before we dive in, we just really wanted to tell everybody thank you, first of all, for you know coming to CrimeCon. And if you were at CrimeCon in Las Vegas uh, this past week, Thank you for coming up to our booth. Thank you for saying hi. There was hugs all around. Um, it was a it was a great time. I mean, I feel like uh, it it was crazy because we had a line from our booth, like kind of going around almost the whole weekend. And the first day when it was happening, I was like, that line of people isn't here for us, you know, because that didn't happen last year. And um, it was just hard to believe that there was people lining up to to talk to us and say hello to us. And, and that was really touching and humbling. And we really appreciate that. Yeah. Really nice to meet you guys in person. We also had the Crime Weekly meetup. We did it off the strip. We had about 60, maybe 50, 60 people there, all Crime Weekly people who had used our code. Yeah, we had some good food, some good laughs. Derek might have got a little tipsy. Yeah, I might have been stumbled off the sidewalk as I was walking back to my hotel. But it was a really <laughs> good time. Loved meeting you guys. It really 
drives home the point that when we're having these conversations, not only with each other, but we're also having them with you. And it's nice to meet you in person and get to kind of interact, not on a business level, but just on a personal level, which is always cool. So that's fun. Um, also, this is our first episode we're recording after the release of Criminal Coffee. Uh, to be frankly honest with you, it exceeded our expectations. We had I know I had a goal in mind of what I thought would be good, way beyond that. And in fact, uh, our roaster and the bag uh, manufacturer was not expecting this demand, uh, the amount of uh, orders we had. So there might be a slight delay on shipping. I won't bore everybody with the details here, but if you ordered already, you should have already received an email or receiving one. We're, you know, this isn't your fault. We're going to be taking care of you guys on the back end with a, co- a discount code. So just be on the lookout for that. But, but again, thank you so much. This is a dream of ours. We're a small business. And we're just getting started and it would not be possible without you guys. So thank you so, so much for the love and support and, and making it possible. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's great. I can't wait for you guys to get the coffee because it is so good. You know, uh, I was drinking it all day on Monday um, and I just thought that it was it was excellent. I thought that I wanted to keep making it. In fact, I was a little annoyed because I didn't want to like dip into two bags on the same day, but I ended up doing that. And um, now I want more criminal coffee because now I'm rationing it because <laughs> the shipping times are, you know, lengthening out. And I'm over here like, well, I need to order mine now <laughs> because I need to get some in quickly because I really don't want to drink any other coffee. It is really, really delicious. It's got a great taste. It's not bitter. It's very smooth really hits nice. I can't wait for you guys to try it out. And when you do get your criminal coffee, if you could go ahead and tag us CC, well, at hashtag CC mugshot with a picture of you and your coffee. So we know what you're thinking of it and how you like it. We really appreciate that because we really want the feedback. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Check it out. Like I said, I don't even have the coffee myself. She's not lying. No bull. <laughs> we do not have the coffee yourself. I There's such it. a shortage on it. It is. It is coming though. It is coming. And as soon as it gets here, Stephanie, myself, our spouse, everyone will be packing it up. So trust me, as soon as we have it, you will have it on its way to you. So let's talk about how paranoid Aaron Hernandez became after someone shot Alexander Bradley in the face, someone who Bradley claimed was Aaron himself. So for some context and to kind of catch us up in the timeline, Aaron and his high school girlfriend, Cheyenne Jenkins, they got engaged in October of 2012. In the following month, they welcomed their baby daughter into the world. Aviel Hernandez was born on November 6, 2012, and the next day, at football practice, Aaron told a reporter, quote, I'm engaged now. I have a baby. It's just going to make me think of life a lot differently and doing things the right way. Now, another one is looking up to me. I can't just be young and reckless, Aaron, no more. I'm going to try and do the right things, become a good father, and let Aviel be raised like I was raised, end quote. So when I was reading it, that statement was very telling to me, and I'm sure it is to you as well, because our entire first episode in this series was focused on Aaron's childhood, and we both agreed it wasn't like the ideal childhood. So do you think that Aaron was just saying what he thought the public wanted to hear? Or do you think he did, in fact, have this like rosy image of his upbringing? It's a great question. I I, I think Aaron's probably the only one that can answer that. I, I would like to think that at this point, he realized he was very fortunate to have a father who was so supportive of his ambitions to be a professional athlete and you, you did tell some very good stories about how his father cried at their game with him and his brother DJ. So I do think we all have an ability to focus on the high points and maybe minimize the low points. And and based on what you've told me about Aaron's perception of his father and some of the things that he did, it, it, it does seem like he was able to compartmentalize those things and look at the bright side, I guess. So yeah, maybe in Aaron's case, that was the situation, but ultimately... Who really knows what was going on in Aaron's head and what he, how he perceived himself and his situation that he was in and how he justified certain things that he did based on what he saw growing up. So you think that he probably was just like, okay, my dad pushed me. He saw my talent. He saw my skill. He fostered it. He helped it grow. I wouldn't be here without him. And yes, he was abusive. Yes, he did these things. But, you know, I'm going to ignore that part of it and just focus on the positives and hopefully try to bring that into my daughter's life. 
kind of that thing? Yeah, I think maybe he viewed it as tough love. I'll also say that probably some of the things he witnessed his father do to his his mother maybe were very traumatic at the time. But when we f- fast forward a little bit and Aaron finds out about his mother sleeping with another man, maybe he looks back at it and says, well, you know, now it's it was kind of warranted. His, my father knew this was the case. So he finds a way to justify those actions for his father. Not saying I agree with it. I'll tell you, I don't. But that may be what's going on in his head. That's interesting. I agree. I think once he had this falling out with his mother, he probably almost got a little bit like, well, you know, she probably always was a pain in the ass. Maybe she was always stepping out on him. And maybe, you know, she made him do this. And to justify that, to make to, to allow his father to still be the hero in his story. Absolutely. Again, we were speculating here, but I think it's a reasonable assumption. You know, we know how he felt about his father. We also know from DJ's own words what his father did to his mother. So we're sitting here trying to wrap around our head around the idea of how could you witness your father, you know, smack your mother's head off a sink or something like that, make her bleed, and and yet you still have him on this pedestal. Well, these might be some of the reasons behind that. Well, Aaron and Cheyenne also moved their little family out of the Plainville townhouse and into a 7,100 square foot colonial style mansion located at 22 Ronald C. Meyer Drive in North Attleboro. It was a lot of house for just the three of them with five bedrooms, five full bathrooms, three half bathrooms, a private theater, sauna, and sprawling backyard with a saltwater pool and cabana. This was located in the bougie part of Bristol County, and the house was the perfect way for Aaron to show that he had made it as a professional football player who had just signed a $40 million contract with the New England Patriots. But Aaron was also growing increasingly paranoid, and he wasn't living in his new house long before he had the Fort Knox of security systems installed with surveillance cameras both inside and outside. And it was here in this house that Aaron would spend time with Odin Lloyd, the 27-year-old boyfriend of Shayana's younger sister, Shania. Now, some people might say that Aaron Hernandez had the upper hand in any relationship that he would develop with Odin Lloyd. Although the two men had a lot of things in common, they were living two completely different lives. Odin Lloyd was a talented football player all throughout high school, and he had planned to continue playing throughout college for Delaware State. But when his financial aid didn't come through, Lloyd was forced to leave school and return home to Dorchester, Massachusetts, where he ended up working for a lawn fertilizer company and playing defense for the Boston Bandits, a semi-professional football team. Odin Lloyd loved football, so he was going to play as often as he could, even if he wasn't doing it in front of a stadium full of screaming fans. Aaron Hernandez practicing with his former team, the New England Patriots. Odin Lloyd's teammates practicing with the semi-pro Boston Bandits. Similar plays, similar moves. But come game day, Hernandez and the Patriots were cheered on at Gillette Stadium by almost 70,000 fans. The Bandits? If you can get maybe 200, you got a big, big game, you know, hopefully you'll get 300. The biggest amount you're going to see in the stands, 300 people. I will say they were two men from two vastly different universes. Hernandez had recently signed a new mouthwatering contract worth forty million dollars. Odin Lloyd, these guys out here, how much do they make per game? No one, for the love of the game. They don't make any money. They don't make no money. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I didn't know a lot about football before we started doing the series, so I didn't even know there was semi-professional football teams and. You know, so I wouldn't obviously know the logistics of how they worked, but it kind of blows my mind that these guys are out there playing. And I mean, not just playing regular games, but going to practices and they're doing this for no money. Like they're not getting paid. They're they're literally just doing it because they loved playing football. And for whatever reason, for Odin Lloyd, it was the fact that, you know, he couldn't afford to go to college. Um, He didn't you know, he probably didn't get a scholarship from a college like like Aaron Hernandez did. He most likely wasn't a star athlete the way that Aaron Hernandez was in, in high school, but he was still very good at football. He loved football, but he didn't get that opportunity to go to college where you would get then discovered by, you know, the the professional football leagues. So he's just a, a circumstance difference that he's just playing 
all every week because he loves to do it because he wants to do it. Yeah, makes perfect sense. And I mean, listen, there's a lot of people out there who love the sport that they play, but unfortunately, they don't have um, the God-given talent needed to to play at the highest level. Aaron Hernandez was one of those people where even though he probably didn't put everything he had into it, he was just blessed with so much talent. He could phone it in essentially and still be that good. Where Odin Lloyd, on the other hand, had that passion, had that drive, was playing for free, and yet just didn't have the talent to play at that next level. So he still played because he loved it. And semi-pro football is uh, no joke. Uh, definitely check out a game in your area if you can. These guys are going full out. A lot of injuries on the field during these games because they're not professional, so they don't know all the tactics. And these guys have full-time jobs, and yet they're out there breaking fingers and stuff, and there ain't no insurance for that. So they're they're limping into work, and they're getting that work injury the next day to, to get it covered. Well, it kind of did seem like, you know, hearing from Odin Lloyd's coaches and his teammates and things, he could have had that that talent and that skill. But he also, I don't think, had the focus that it was sort of forced on Aaron from being in a legacy family. You know, he came from a family that was all about football. His father was a football player in high school and college, and he sort of was born into this you're going to be a football player kind of thing. And so therefore he was constantly reminded of that and focused of that. Whereas I believe it was Odin Lloyd's coach who said, um, you know, he liked the ladies, you know, he liked to kind of have fun throughout high school and he allowed himself to get distracted. Had he not, he may have exhibited the kind of talent that could have gotten him a scholarship, but he probably didn't have that really strong um, family pressure and push behind him. Because from what I understand, Odin Lloyd was raised by a single mother who had other children. And I know from experience, when you're a single mother with, you know, with more than one kid running around, you really don't have time to put that focus into one child specifically and like nurture their talents and things. So it really does have a lot to do with your circumstances. Yeah. Well, there is definitely two ends of the spectrum there. Who knows why he didn't get to that level, but we've, we've discussed Aaron's father at length. As you just mentioned, he was pushing him very hard to be the best he could be where Odin didn't have that driving force, that that person to look up to as far as the football field was concerned. Yeah. And of course, as someone who loved football, Odin Lloyd knew who Aaron Hernandez was, and he was a big fan. And the two men had first met in August of 2012 when Aaron gave Shania a skybox at Gillette Stadium for her birthday. It turned out that Aaron and Odin had more in common than just football. They both also loved to get high, hang out, and play video games in the basement. Uh, and, and basically, during those visits, uh, a typical pattern would be that Aaron and Odin would hang out and you would hang out with your sister or other family members. Yes. And uh, some of the activities that Aaron and Odin would do would be to smoke marijuana. Correct. Did it appear to you that they were enjoying each other's company? Yes. I want to say something because this is something that I've experienced and maybe that wasn't the case here, but you've already said it. Shania and Shiana were sisters. So obviously Shiana's dating Aaron, Shania's dating Odin. So naturally when the two sisters get together, the boyfriends or the husbands are going to hang out as well. So I don't necessarily know if this was a natural connection. This was something that was due to circumstance where Aaron and Odin became close or acquaintances because of the sister connection. I think that's important. Because I don't want people assuming as we tell this story that Odin was someone that he grew up with and was like a connection that he developed on his own. This was kind of forced together and it worked. You know, they were put, like you had just said, they smoked together, uh, probably drank together, played video games. So it worked because they had some things in common. But I think it's very important to acknowledge that if it weren't for the two sisters being related, Odin probably never comes into Aaron's life. And, and maybe that's a factor as we talk about Odin and his death and Aaron's uh, ability to see him as expendable. Yeah, I was just going to say the exact same thing. If if these two sisters hadn't you know, introduced them, and we've seen it a million times, I mean, my sister and her husband and me and my husband hang out. So naturally, my husband and my sister's husband are now, you know, like friendly. And they find as they hang out that they have things in common and they they like to do things together and et cetera, et cetera. But had my sister and I not introduced the two of them, they never would have crossed paths. They never would have met. They, they are from two different backgrounds, two different worlds. They never would have um, known each other. So it is important. I think that, you know, Going forward, 
Aaron and Odin would have become brothers, you know, that's that's an, a brother in law relationship. That's also not like a necessarily friendship relationship because you don't always <laughs> like your family. You're just kind of stuck with them and you make it work and you get along. But I mean, it seemed at first it was sort of casual and they liked each other. They hung out. They they had things in common. But I do also think, like I said, there was a little bit of an imbalance because Odin knew who Aaron was before he met him. Odin was a fan, obviously. Aaron was somebody that Odin wanted to be, right? The life he wanted to live. So it may have been more of a, in, you know, an, I'm, I'm looking up to you. You're kind of like my idol. I can't believe I'm hanging out with you here thing. And Aaron may have you know, taken advantage of that in the end. And I definitely don't think that he cared about Odin in in any way that made him an important person in his life. No. Yeah, I agree. He might have sensed that he's more of a, you know, I got to hang out with him because my fiance wants me to be nice and I can tell he's a fan. But, you know, I'll play ball, play some video games, smoke a blunt. You know, I'll be the good boyfriend, the good fiance. Yeah, so the, the women are upstairs drinking wine, cooking, whatever, and the men are just like, well, we don't want to be here with the ladies, so I guess we'll just go off. And, and it's just kind of this thing that, yeah, they're they're together. And, I mean, they really didn't even know each other for that long before Odin Lloyd was murdered. So I don't think there was the opportunity to form a connection. And by that time, I would say that I think Aaron was too far gone, too paranoid, too untrusting of everybody in general to form an actual bond with anyone. True. And, and we've already discussed from last episode, uh, Mr. Bradley, you know, someone who Aaron was close with, who he chose to hang out with because he liked him, right? Because he saw him as an equal. And yet he allegedly shot him right in the face. So when you think about Odin and that relationship not being as strong as, as it was with Bradley, that tells you what what Aaron would do to someone who he really doesn't value or respect. I don't know if there really was anybody that Aaron valued and respected besides possibly his brother. Fair point. Yeah. I don't even think that he he held a lot of value or respect for his own fiance. Um I don't think that any of the other guys from like cousin Tanya's house that he hung out with, he didn't value and respect them. He used people. He used people. um, You know, you can protect me. You can offer me protection. You can offer me street cred. You offer me legitimacy. You offer me somebody to hang out with at the club. But I don't trust any of you. And I would throw any one of you under the bus if I could. Yeah, I think that's fair. Reportedly, Aaron's nickname for Lloyd was Bluntmaster because Odin Lloyd rolled blunts very quickly, which Aaron liked because he could smoke them pretty fast. I mean, by this time, they said he was smoking like 12 blunts in one sitting, which is bananas to me. I can't even imagine um, how you would feel or what what place your brain would be in at that point. But Odin Lloyd was not just Shania Jenkins' boyfriend. He was not just Aaron's friend who could roll blunts really fast. He was a real person. He had a history. He had many layers to him. Odin was raised by a single mother, Ursula Ward, who struggled all her life to provide for her children. And Odin was Ursula's only son, and he was her pride and joy. She referred to him as one of those kids whose smile could just light up your world. And unlike Aaron, Odin seemed to have true, really tight bonded friendships from childhood. Kids he grew up with, came up with, who he was with throughout high school, who he would go on to play, you know, football with, people who trusted him, people who he trusted, people who would go to bat for him. And all of these people had nothing but amazing things to say about him um, after his death. And Ursula, Odin's mother, she was happy that Odin had met someone who he could be serious about and, you know, maybe settle down with because he had told her that Shania Jenkins was the one and she was going to be his wife one day. And eventually Ursula grew to love Shania like she was her own daughter. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. We want to talk for a little bit about something that's very important, but we don't really place enough importance on it at all, and that is your sleep. The quality of it, how long you sleep, but most importantly, the quality of it. So I've had my Helix Sleep Mattress 
for I feel like almost two years now and maybe longer. And I know Derek has had his for quite a while as well. And honestly, I'm obsessed with it. I will never sleep on another mattress unless it's another Helix mattress. And uh, I just realize the difference is I wake up feeling so much more refreshed. And not only that, with less aches and pains, which is something that you deal with when you get a little bit older. Helix Sleep has a quiz and you take this quiz. It takes just two minutes to complete and it matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? With Helix, you're getting a mattress that you know will be perfect for the way that you sleep. Everybody's unique and Helix knows that. So they have several different mattress models to choose from. They've got soft ones, medium, firm mattresses. Mattress is great for cooling you down if you sleep hot. Mattresses that are good for spinal alignment to prevent morning aches and pains and even a Helix plus size mattress for plus size sleepers. I took the Helix quiz and I was matched with the Midnight Lux model. Uh, I wanted something that felt, you know, medium to firm. I'm a side sleeper. I kind of do toss and turn at night. And with the Midnight Lux, it's really, it's really reduced my tossing and turning. I sort of wake up in the same position I fell asleep in, which is probably why I'm getting better quality sleep because I'm not waking up every time I move. So if you're looking for a mattress, all you have to do is take the quiz, you order the mattress that you're matched to, and the mattress comes right to your door, shipped for free. It shows up in a a box where you're like, there's no way there's a mattress in here, right? But then there is. You pull it out, it expands, you put it on your bed. It's really easy. If I can do it uh, by myself, then anybody can. And with Helix Sleep, you don't ever have to go to a mattress store again. Helix is awesome, but you don't have to take our word for it. They were awarded the number one best overall mattress of 2021 by GQ and Wired Magazine. And Helix has been recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to solution for improving sleep. All you have to do is go to helixsleep.com slash crimeweekly, take their two-minute sleep quiz. They'll match you to a customized mattress and you will get the best sleep of your life. Yeah, guys, you know we love Helix Sleep. We've been talking about them for a long time. And right now they're offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash crimeweekly. Once again, that's helixsleep.com slash crimeweekly. Check them out, guys. You will not regret it. A week after Alexander Bradley was shot in the face, Aaron flew to Indianapolis, where the NFL Combine is held every year. Now, the Combine is a four-day invitation-only event that allows NFL scouts and coaches to evaluate the top draft eligible college players. And it seems kind of like it's it's a more physical thing, like the coaches and the scouts and things, they like sit in the stands and they put these um, you know, very special players who are invited to be there through like a gauntlet kind of, and they kind of just watch them. It's, it's kind of like the Hunger Games a little bit. Um, once again, something I did not know about until I started, you know, researching this case. But the point is there would have been no valid reason for Aaron as a professional football player to have been there. But he went there because he needed to talk to his coach, Bill Belichick, who was in Indianapolis, and it just couldn't wait. Aaron told Belichick that he was afraid, not only for himself, but for the safety of his fiance and newborn baby. Aaron begged the coach to trade him to a West Coast team, but Belichick said a trade was not possible. Instead, he said he would connect Aaron with the Patriots' security chief. So, first of all, it's very um, sort of like hush-hush about this whole thing happening at the Combine, and Bill Belichick has never really, like, admitted that he had this conversation, but several people who are like in that circle have been like, yeah, it happened. But why would Belichick have told Aaron like, no, I can't trade you? Is it because he just signed a $40 million contract? Like, I don't I can't even imagine the logistics of that. It would be a complete nightmare. Yeah. I mean, again, I wasn't there, but Bill Belichick is a this is a business. And they valued Aaron's talent and obviously saw a lot of potential in him for the future, which is why they gave him so much money. So when someone like that, who they just signed to a multi-million dollar deal over a period of four, whatever it was, four or five years, they're not just going to throw that away. That would be a tough trade as well. So, you know, he's there to be a coach and also mitigate. A lot of these players probably have personal issues they go through, and that's part of the coach's job to say, hey, listen, relax. You know, let's not hit the nuclear option here. There might be other alternatives first. And, you know, he probably said to Aaron, hey, listen, I understand you got some issues and 
I don't think the trade is necessarily going to solve your problem. Let's just talk to our security team and see if we can beefing up your protection that way and maybe you'll feel better and then we'll revisit it. But, you know, that's his job. He's kind of balancing multiple plates, keeping everyone spinning. And that was probably the case here. As far as him not speaking about it publicly, I know there's not everyone here is a football fan, but Bill Belichick is notorious for being someone who is a man of few words. He does it in his press conferences. He's like, that's what he's known for. They'll get up there and say, you know, Bill, what'd you think of this week's game? You just won 42 to nothing. And he'll go, played good. Could be better. Like no, no elaborate elaborating on anything. Like he's known for that. So to have a situation like this where there's some legality to it, he's definitely not going to ever speak on it ever. Do you think that it's possible he didn't speak on it because in the wake of everything that Aaron Hernandez did when it all came out, it sort of was like, how did nobody know that this was happening? How did nobody know that this kid was so far off the rails? And then it ends up, you know, sort of coming out that. There were people who knew. There were people in the NFL. There were people uh, who were involved with the Patriots who knew that Aaron was going through some stuff. And because he was such a high-value asset to them, they sort of swept it under the rug, just hoping it would go away and, and things would like turn out all right. It's possible. And even if that weren't the case, I'm sure they had lawyers advising them to say as little as possible. I, I, I know that Bob Kraft, he testified under oath for this whole trial. So just for his involvement. So yeah, I'm sure there were a lot of lawyers involved as things started to come out about Aaron where they said, Hey, listen, you're not, you're not going to speak about this publicly. If the Attleboro police department or any agency wants to speak to you, yeah, we'll be there. You'll have legal representation, but for the sake of getting you in trouble for something you may or may not have done, you're not allowed to say anything. So I'm sure there was, and we're talking millions of dollars here. Um, I don't know if you're going to go into it, but there was some elements of this where Aaron was still, um, in uh, in death trying to get his money. And so this was a really big thing when you talk about $40 million that he, he was trying to still, his family was still trying to collect. So a lot of money at stake here. And, and that's why the, everyone was very tight lipped about everything involving Aaron. And when Derek refers to Bob Kraft, he's talking about Robert Kraft, who's the owner of the Patriots. Um, and it was very odd for everybody to see this man who, I mean, I don't know how much he's worth, but let's just say it's a lot, one of those more money than God kind of situations, uh, walk into like this public courtroom and and sit there on the stand and testify. Because basically, yeah, Aaron did approach Bob Kraft as well and say, like, I'm afraid things are going on, things are happening. And, uh, you know, it was I, I do think that there was some culpability there on behalf of the team and not just obviously the owner and the coach, but a lot of people under them who these things got shuffled around to. And we're going to talk about that in a minute too, but like they kind of just were like, listen, we're paying this kid a lot of money. He had red flags all over him to begin with. We brought him on regardless of that because of his talent. And now we just hope it doesn't bite us. And I would be even willing to go as far as saying up until that point, there was probably some minor things but there obviously wasn't anything over the top or they wouldn't have committed that much money to him. But go figure, as soon as you know he's playing ball, he's playing great on the field, minor instances here and there maybe, but nothing that's like super big red flag they've got to watch out for. So they go, you know what? You stayed true to your word. You've been pretty well behaved. Let's give you a big deal, reward you for your services on the field. And as soon as they do, all this happens. So now they're probably going, oh my God, we just committed all this money. Now this happens. Great. And you know, just like any job, you just, you give someone a big contract for multiple years and you're obligated to pay that money. I'm sure there was some guaranteed money already given to them. Yeah. You're, you're going to try to solve that problem without losing that asset. Cause that's really what the NFL is. Let's not, let's call it what it is. Do they care about the players? Maybe a little bit, but ultimately these guys are performing a service, their assets on the field. They're just trying to mitigate the stuff off the field so it doesn't affect the on the field play. That's really all they care about. That it's about the bottom dollar. Yeah, I do feel like maybe there's a little buyer's remorse happening at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, right. Exactly. Well, in the week between Bradley's shooting and this unorthodox request, because this is a very unorthodox request, right? A player's not going to be like, thanks for the $40 million contract as like this brand new, you know, NFL player. 
but like now I want to move teams completely and go across the country. This is really unheard of. I probably think that the Patriots didn't even know what to make of it when it happened. But um, between Bradley shooting and this request, there had been a flurry of texts exchanged between Aaron and Alexander Bradley that had clearly made Aaron feel that leaving the East Coast was the only way he could be safe. On March 2nd, Bradley texted Aaron, accusing him of shooting him and leaving him for dead. And Aaron then changed Bradley's name and his contacts to lies. Bradley texted, quote, yo, the crazy part about all of this is you did that for no fucking reason. And me being the real friend I was to you didn't even try to ruin you, even after you tried to kill me. Think about how real that is. So I was the real friend at the end of the day, and the tears should be in my eyes after the way you betrayed me. End quote. Aaron responded, quote, I love you, and you are not going to frame me for some bread. Always will love you because you were my brother, and you know that, but hope the best for you. End quote. Bradley responded, quote, I would never try to frame you. You left me with one eye and a lot of head trauma. You owe for what you did, and it's too bad you didn't know me enough to know that this convo is private between us. This ain't for no lawyer or cop to see. We both know what happened is the truth. The truth. You too paranoid. That's what made you do this. End quote. So the, a lot of these texts, and I obviously can't read them all here, but you can find them online. These texts go on and on and on. And Bradley's consistently saying, like, you shot me. Like, I'm not going to do anything to you publicly. I'm going to get back at you. Like, I'm coming for you, right? And Aaron always responds very smartly. He never says, like, I'm sorry I did that or this, this or that or, you know, it was a mistake. He's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. You're crazy. Why are you trying to put this on me? Because he's so paranoid right now. He thinks people are like, looking at his phone. You know, that's why he wouldn't let any iPhones be around him. So he thinks people are like reading his messages and he probably thinks that Bradley might be with like a cop at this moment or, you know, with somebody, some sort of authority type figure who's just waiting for Aaron Hernandez to make some sort of con concession or some sort of admittance of guilt. Completely agree. And at, and if it's not that extreme, at minimum, he thinks it's it's Bradley trying to get money from him. You took my eye you owe me something. I should be compensated for this. Throw me, throw me a million bucks for losing an eye and it goes away. Because he said it right in the text response. You're not getting bread off me. You're not getting money from me. So it could also be that where exactly what you said, worst case scenario, he's a confidential witness now and he's trying to get Aaron to admit to it in a text. Uh, best case scenario, he's trying to get money off of him. And so I bet Aaron was telling people around him, maybe even some lawyers, listen, I don't know what this guy's talking about. He's trying to extort money from me. And, you know, I'm just going to tell him in the text and to everyone that I know, he's lying. I'm going to get in front of this and make sure people know that when they start hearing about this, it's all a, it's all a cash grab. Yeah. And you can see in these texts, Aaron's like, I love you, man. Like, why are you doing this? You know, like, we're so close. You know, you, you I re still remember like I still I was watching videos of us hanging out the other day and he's talking like like nothing happened. And Bradley's getting pissed and he's like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> you shot me in the face. Right. Like We were both there, you know, and Aaron's like, man, you need some help. Like, I hope you work everything out. Like, so Bradley's getting more pissed because Aaron is just not budging at all. He's not saying anything to admit it. And I truly think that, um, you know, Bradley didn't initially want to get any money from Aaron. I think he wanted to kill him. He admits to this in, in court. He said, no, I wanted to take him out myself. That's why I didn't tell the police. So he's getting mad because he wants to, like, have a real kind of, I guess, man to man conversation with Aaron. Like, you did this. Like, why did you do this? And Aaron's just like, I love you, man. You know, what's going on? Why are you doing this to me? And Bradley's getting, like, significantly more agitated with every text. Yep. Definitely see that. So after Bill Belichick told Aaron that he wasn't going to be traded, Aaron turned to his agent, Brian Murphy. Now, Murphy would also later testify about Aaron's rising paranoia, saying, quote, there were several occasions where we would be at Gillette Stadium or we'd be at a restaurant near the stadium and he was afraid someone was following him or that someone was going to attack him, end quote. Aaron did eventually tell his agent, who was the president of the athlete's first agency, that Bradley was threatening him. So Murphy called Alexander Bradley's attorney and tried to quietly settle the disagreement between the two men. Now, at this point, Brian Murphy was well aware that Alexander Bradley was accusing Aaron Hernandez of trying to kill him. He was also aware that Bradley was threatening Aaron 
but he did not tell anyone, not anyone affiliated with the Patriots or law enforcement. What do you think about that? Well, it's for contract reasons, more than likely, because in your contract, you know, we're talking millions of dollars. There's a it's a lengthy contract. And in there, there's probably some not probably there is a conduct on becoming something that would violate the contract that you signed. You signed and may ultimately result in a loss of finances and loss of money because now you're in violation of said contract and therefore they're no longer obligated to pay you. So I'm sure he was very concerned about that, having this get out having this become a situation where the Patriots come back to him and say, hey, based on what happened, you know, we're going to need that money back, whatever we paid you already, because now you're not living up to your end of the agreement. I'm sure that's a concern for all these athletes. Whenever they're accused of something, whether they did it or not, you know, the the teams, because again, it's all about the bottom dollar, whether the teams believe the allegations or not, trying to use that as leverage to get some of their money back and get a discount on the player they just paid for. Oh, I'm sure there was some sort of like morality clause or something, right, in his contract. Yeah, of course. If, For sure. If it defames the team, if it makes them look bad in any way, you, there's probably penalties associated with it. Just like any job, just like you and I, you know, and everybody who's under a contract, you can be, you got to be held responsible for that because you're, you're obviously identified with other brands. But Aaron's life is in danger. Okay, Aaron is saying, I did not do this. I can prove I didn't do this. And he says this to Alexander Bradley in the text. I can prove I didn't do this. In a court of law, I can prove that I didn't do this. I didn't do this. And he's being threatened. His life is being threatened to the point where he wants to go across country. And you don't think at, at any point that Brian Murphy would it would behoove him to, like, call the police? Hey, this kid's life is in danger. Like, if you're dead, it doesn't really matter how much your contract is worth or how, you know, much the Patriots are going to be upset because you're not playing any games and you're not making any money because you got taken out by some dude who's exacting his revenge. So don't you think that there should have been some sort of law enforcement presence like brought in at this point? You know, it's kind of irresponsible if he's such a big asset that you're just leaving him out there unprotected while some street guy is threatening to kill him. No, I agree. I wonder what the conversations were behind closed doors based on what you've told me about Aaron so far. My assumption would be Aaron's going to him, telling him he wants out of New England. And then when his agent saying, well, we should probably get law enforcement involved. Aaron's because he's by the code. He's not a snitch. It's like, no, no, no. I don't want anything on paper. I don't want to go to the police. I just want out of here. Get me out of here. I don't know if that happened, but just a little because we weren't part of that conversation. Could there have been a situation where this agent suggested they get law enforcement involved? Potential that could have happened. And based on Aaron's code and his uh, how much he valued the perception of others as far as his street, you know, his street credit, obviously going to the police is not something that's it's frowned upon by these types of individuals. So he might have wanted to avoid that. Well, Aaron ended up hiring an old friend from his aunt's house to act as his private security guard night and day. And this friend was Ernest Bo Wallace. Additionally, Bill Belichick arranged for Kevin Anderson, a Patriots staffer, to work with Aaron in finding a temporary living space for him and his family to relocate to until whatever threat that pursued him went away. Kevin Anderson would later say that he believed Aaron would want someplace obviously big enough to accommodate his family, nice enough to replace like the high security mansion he was living in and with enough security to make him feel safe. But when he texted Aaron on April 9th asking when he would have time to check out some houses, Aaron told him like, listen, I want something simple. I just want a fully furnished apartment off a main road. And I want it by April 15th. This is April 9th that he says this. Like, basically, I want this apartment next week. So confused, Kevin Anderson responded, quote, you mean April 15th? I always understood the plan was for you to see them. I can't just pick one. End quote. Aaron told Kevin Anderson, it doesn't have to be a nice place. I just want it ASAP. The Patriots ended up renting a condo in Franklin, Massachusetts for Aaron. It was not heavily secured. It didn't even have a security gate. It was just a basic condo that the prosecution would later claim in court was intended to be used as a flop house, not as a safe haven. Because basically what Aaron did with this apartment was he really didn't ever bring um, his fiance or his baby there. He brought his friends from, you know, his aunt's house and he would smoke pot. And like the neighbors would later say, like, we just smelled the skunky smell all the time and we didn't know what was happening. You know, and they just basically would go there, smoke pot. Sometimes he would bring women there 
And he basically kind of used it as like a man cave. And there's no security at this place. It's just like your basic apartment complex. There was no safety there. There was way less safety and security there than he had at his house. Very contradicting, right? You know, you think about it. He's so concerned about his safety and the safety of the people he cares about the most, which is his daughter and his fiance. And yet, if he was concerned about some type of drive-by or home invasion where Bradley was going to make his way up there and, you know, go into the house where he knew Aaron was laying his head at night, well, Aaron wouldn't be there, but his the people he quote unquote cared about would be. There's a drive-by. The only people that potentially could be hurt would be his daughter and his fiance. Not really the way uh, you would assume uh, he would conduct himself if that's really what he was concerned about. So it really makes you wonder what the agenda was when he started going to Bill Belichick and he started going to his agent. Maybe the initial intention was the fear of retaliation. And then as he got the new place, he realized, well, if he would have came after me, he would have came already. And this is kind of nice to have this. You know, I can do what I want bring over who I want. And, you know, it's kind of like me getting to live the single life here and getting to live the, you know, quote unquote, married life uh, when I'm at home. Yeah, it kind of goes back to that double life, right? Because at his really nice mansion, he's Aaron Hernandez, you know, a tight end for the Patriots, family man, upstanding citizen. And when he's at his uh, Franklin apartment, He's Aaron Hernandez, a guy off the streets, hanging with the thugs, smoking weed, playing music, you know, being like just a normal guy that he wants to be. And and this way he can live this double life without anybody asking too many questions because his other house, the nice house, was in a really nice upscale neighborhood. He can't really be doing the things that he wants to do there, even though you'd think he could because it's a huge house. It's got privacy. I mean, he can probably do whatever he wants, but maybe it was about his fiance not knowing. Maybe he didn't want to bring that kind of element around his daughter. Who knows? I really can't tell you why. I have no, it's so bizarre. I have no response. I'm pretty confident based on what we'll find out about Shania down the road. She wasn't too concerned about him doing drugs or anything or playing video games in the house. So my hunch would be it was probably about women. Well, she wasn't really concerned about him doing much of anything, and she'd caught him cheating on her before. So, yeah, it, it might have been about women because this gives him the freedom. I wonder if she even knew about this place. I'm going to have to look into that. I, I would probably say if she did, he had a way to justify it or probably didn't at all. But you just said it too, right? She caught him cheating, so she clearly wasn't on board for it. So it was one of those things where she might have known things were going on. But he was trying not to just, you know, throw it in her face because from what we've heard in court testimony and stuff, she really wasn't concerned about some of his other extracurricular activities, who he was hanging out with, what substances he was using. I think it would really come down to him being a very attractive dude, millions of dollars, fans throwing themselves at him every single day and him wanting to capitalize on that without um, being held accountable by his fiance. Yeah, I mean, and and we're going to get into this, obviously, but there is a lot of speculation that his fiance knew a lot more about about more of his extracurricular activities than than people would think. And she was kind of really like down for it and, and covered for him and helped him in situations where I think a, a logical person probably wouldn't have. But like you said, you know, she had a lot to lose in this situation. That's right. I mean, it really didn't matter, though, that he was being threatened and he didn't have a super secure place to live because all of this was happening during the NFL offseason. And Aaron and Shayana had basically moved to Hermosa Beach in California. Now, Aaron would tell people that he had done this to be closer to Tom Brady, who at that time spent a good chunk of his offseason with his wife Giselle in L.A., But really, Aaron was doing everything in his power to avoid the East Coast for as long as humanly possible. It was at his beach house overlooking the Pacific Ocean where the Hamosa Beach Police received a call from Shayana Jenkins on March 25th. She wanted an ambulance sent to the house, and she told the dispatcher that Aaron had purposely cut himself on his hand and was losing a lot of blood. Now, what would you think if you're the dispatcher? And this woman says he caught himself. He's bleeding a lot. You're going to think that he he tried to take his own life. Cut his hand. I, I would be thinking possibly that, although cutting your hand wouldn't usually kill you. I would also think there was possibly a domestic dispute. That would be the two things that would come to mind. Well, what had actually happened was Aaron and Shayana had gotten into an argument and Aaron had punched his fist 
through a window. 911, may I help you? Hi, I need an ambulance immediately. Okay, what's the address? What's going on? He's losing a lot of blood. He cut himself. Okay, where did he cut himself? On his wrist. How old is he? He's 23. Did he do this on purpose? Yes. Both wrists or just one? One. Are you sending someone to someone in transit? Yeah, I'm making up the call right now. You need to be calm. Okay, has he ever, has he ever tried to do this before? No. No, this is his first time? Yes. Okay, has he ever threatened suicide or anything in the no, past or no? No, 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 no? Okay, so what what made him do this tonight? So we got into an argument. Okay. So you, you guys got in an argument and that's why he did it? Yes. Okay, well, I made, it, I made up the call. I have police and I have paramedics on the way, okay? Do you guys have something over the cut to put pressure on it? He, yes, he has a towel. Okay. Okay. Are you his girlfriend? Yes, his fiance. You're his fiance, okay. Has anybody been drinking tonight? Yes. Do you guys both have or him? Or just him? No, just him. Just him? Okay. Has anybody been doing any drugs? No. Okay. You don't have any weapons or anything, do you? Was it a kitchen knife you used? No. No, no, it wasn't a kitchen knife or yes? No, no. What, what, what did he use? He broke his arm, or his, he cut his wrist on the window. So did he break a window? Yes. Okay, so he didn't, did he take, like, a piece of the window and cut his wrist with it, or he punched the window well, and he did not accident? He punched the window in. Okay, well, you didn't tell me that before. You made it okay, seem well, like he cut himself. He's bleeding. I don't okay. know how many Okay, ma'am, ma'am, these are questions police and paramedics need to okay, know when I they get somewhere, okay? All right, if you understand, then you need to, if you understand, then you need to answer the questions, okay? Right now, I'm and I just can't stand the questions you're asking. Okay, well, I'm sorry, ma'am, but these are questions. on the phone, then give me someone nicer. Ma'am, I'm sorry, but these are questions we have to ask. I already told you I have paramedics and I have police on the okay, way, okay? Why are we still talking then? Because I just told you, ma'am, okay, because these are questions they need to know. There. Right, but they, they these are things they need to know before they get there. All right, so let me weigh in on this because I've been critical of dispatch in the past. The reason the dispatcher is acting the way she's acting is very obvious because Cheyenne is not telling her the full story. And it's very important for police to know what they're walking into. And, and for first responders in general, are they walking into a suicidal male? who has just tried to take his own life and may try to carry out a suicide by cop, or is he still in possession of the knife or glass that he used to harm himself? Super important questions when you're entering a house and you don't know what you're walking into. However, it became very apparent to this dispatcher quickly that Cheyenne was just telling them what she thought they wanted to hear. And as soon as the dispatcher started to hone in on what really happened, Cheyenne became super defensive. And so I think the dispatcher handled it as well as she could. Cheyenne was completely out of line, no doubt about it. I mean, the woman's trying to help her and trying to protect the first responders that are responding. And Cheyenne is basically saying, why are we still talking? It was it was ridiculous, but completely necessary for the dispatcher to ask those questions, especially when the caller is contradicting themselves. Just hearing that for the first time, initially Cheyenne spun it as if this was a, uh, uh, an attempted suicide. And when dispatcher started to hone in on it, that's when she was like, oh, God, she's in on it now. She knows that this wasn't what I've been portraying it to be. So, yeah, not the first time I've heard a call go that direction, but I thought the dispatcher handled it pretty well. I don't even think Cheyenne was trying to make it seem as if he was, you know, suicidal. I think she was just trying to tell them as little as possible without telling them yeah. that he had punched through a window because it's ridiculous you know you always see this happening in in cases or even like on tv and the guy just like punches a mirror or punches his hand through a window and you're like why why because they've lost control of themselves because no logical person in their right state of mind would do something that ridiculous that could cause serious harm to you i mean you could sever um veins things like that when you're punching through a window it's absolutely idiotic to do that so she doesn't want to say that that's what happened. She just wants basically the dispatcher to know that he's injured. They need somebody to come help. And I don't want to tell you all of the details because this is Aaron Hernandez. You don't need to know this stuff. This is our private life and we want this to stay private and you shouldn't even be asking me this. And at one and at one point, Shayana says, can you put someone nicer on the phone? <laughs> like she's calling yeah. in, you know, to like a customer service rep, like, can I talk to your manager kind of thing? Like that's not how this works when you're calling for emergency services that's the kind of entitlement that we're talking about here. And it kind of shows you, like, was there domestic violence on, you know, in their relationship? 
it's possible that there was. This could have been something that rubbed off on Aaron. But I will say that clearly he had a temper that he didn't have control of at all times. Yeah, I would I would be very confident in saying there was some form of domestic violence, whether it was verbal or physical. Uh, and I would also say for anyone in the comments who says, you know, you just, you know, she just wanted someone to get there. You have to know that while that dispatcher is talking, she's already typing on the computer. So the sense of urgency as far as response is concerned doesn't change. The man's injured. He's losing a lot of blood. She's not going to tell them, hey, guys, you can slow down. It was self-inflicted. You know what I mean? She's still going to get the people there as fast as possible. But the why is super important because now you're putting others' lives in jeopardy as they're, as they're entering the home. She's trying to figure out the, the mental state of the person they're going to administer you know, care to. Is this someone who's going to fight them when they get there or is someone who's going to be cooperative? That's what she's trying to get down to. Is this someone who's combative, irate, or is this someone who made a mistake, maybe did something that they regret now and they need help immediately? Those things are very important. So hopefully most people you know, saw it and heard it the way we did. But we may have some people who disagree. I'm sure we always do. She was very clear. She said, I already have people. There's people on the way. Like, that's not changing. I'm just asking these questions because this is going to update these first responders as they're going there. But they're already on their way. And that's when Cheyenne's like, why are we even that's still right. talking? They, she doesn't find out the truth. Firefighters show up first and all of a sudden the guy takes the glass or the knife and stabs one of them. Now that's on the dispatcher's conscience for not getting that information. That's why it's important. All right. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. With HelloFresh, you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. HelloFresh lets you skip those trips to the grocery store, and it makes home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. So there's a lot of things that HelloFresh does that helps me personally in my day-to-day life. I'm very busy throughout the day, and then the day flies by because when you're doing the same thing all day, every day, which is sitting in front of your computer, it seems like eight hours passes by in the blink of an eye, and then I look up and it's time for dinner and I have nothing ready. So with HelloFresh, they help save time and stress. They offer convenient, contact-free delivery right to your doorstep for easy home cooking with the family. The recipes are easy to follow and quick to make. They have steps and pictures, so they guide you along the way step by step. Super easy. And HelloFresh cuts out that stressful meal planning and grocery store trips, which takes a lot of time. So you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in about 30 minutes or less. Plus, HelloFresh is 30% cheaper than shopping at your local grocery store, and you get to skip the checkout lines. And having it be much more affordable now is really something that's important because everything seems to be more expensive. There's like food shortages, gas is on the rise. So anywhere you can save a buck is very important. Plus, HelloFresh gives you the flexibility that you need for your busy life. Um, They give you customizable orders every week so you can add extra proteins and sides. You can change up the serving size when you have guests or just double up on your favorite recipes so that your box ends up working harder for you. And you can easily change your delivery days or food preferences or skip a week whenever you need if you're going to be out of town or you just have dinner plans that week. Feeding the whole family has never been easier with larger box sizes for more servings and more savings. And HelloFresh offers 50 weekly recipes. They feature a range of flavors, cuisines, and ingredients, so you and your family are never going to get bored. You can try something new every week. There's something for everyone, including low-calorie options, vegetarian options, and family-friendly recipes. And they deliver you fresh, high-quality pre-portioned ingredients so you can make meals that are delicious and nutritious, and you're not having a lot of food waste because you're not buying stuff that you don't need. Plus, over 90% of the ingredients are sourced directly from from farmers to ensure that only the freshest produce and proteins are delivered right to your door. So it's very much farm to table. They're fresh when they get to you instead of waiting on the grocery store shelf for you to pick them out. So we love HelloFresh. We love using HelloFresh to cook with our families. And if you want to try HelloFresh out for yourself, Derek is going to tell you how. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeWeekly16 and use our code CrimeWeekly16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Once again, that's HelloFresh.com slash CrimeWeekly16 and use our code CrimeWeekly16. Check it out, guys. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit.
Again, on April 2nd, police officers were dispatched to Aaron's Hermosa Beach home after neighbors heard yelling and things being thrown around in the house. The incident was closed with a report that, quote, female will pack some stuff, male has left and will come back later, end quote. And when they weren't fighting and Aaron wasn't punching through windows, he and Shayana were visiting tattoo shops. Aaron and Shayana got corresponding tattoos with lyrics from the Incubus song, Dig. Aaron's read, quote, remind me that we'll always have each other. And Shayana's completed the verse with the words, quote, when everything else is gone. It's actually a really good song. But um, this is, to me, listen, this is a codependent kind of toxic relationship when you're fighting one minute to the point where police have to be called and the next minute you're getting like permanent tattoos with, um, you know, song lyrics. To me, it's a very juvenile thing to do, um, especially if you're if your relationship's not on firm ground and clearly theirs was not. No, I agree. Very toxic relationship. And it's like they fight hard, but they love harder where after a, 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 a strong fight where cops are involved or whatever, that's when they do the things to try to re instill their love for each other by what well, better way than to get something permanent. Right. Yeah. Very Bonnie and Clyde, you know. Mm. Yeah. Hard pass for me. On April 11th, Aaron deposited two checks into his Bank of America account, one from the Patriots for almost two million dollars, which I'm sure was the advance, one from Puma for 30 grand. He then had the bank wire 15 grand to Florida, and this money ended up in the hands of Ernest Bo Wallace, who used it to buy two guns, a Colt AR-15 and a Hungarian-made AK-47. Another associate of Aaron's, Oscar Hernandez, no relation, he purchased a Toyota Camry, uh, put the guns inside of the Toyota Camry, and then had that car shipped to Aaron's North Attleboro mansion, where Aaron's fiance Shayana would later sign for it. And then Aaron went back to the same tattoo shop in Hermosa Beach. Tattoo artist David Nelson would later testify that Aaron wanted a very specific tattoo on his right arm. Aaron told Nelson to draw the image of a revolver facing forward as if pointing out towards the viewer. And then he instructed Nelson to draw five bullets visible in the chamber with one cylinder empty. Aaron also had Nelson tattoo him with an automatic handgun, a spent shell casing, a puff of smoke, and the phrase, God forgives, written backwards so that it could only be read in a mirror. These tattoos would be used in court by the prosecution in order to try and prove that Aaron had been responsible for the murders of Daniel De Abreu and Sefiro Furtado in Boston. The Boston Globe reported, quote, One new tattoo showed a revolver loaded with five bullets, which allegedly represents the five shots fired at the scene where De Abreu and Furtado were slain. Authorities allege Hernandez used a 38 caliber revolver to murder the two men. The tattoo artist also drew a semi-automatic handgun and a spent shell casing with a puff of smoke. The image, the prosecutor said, matches what happened to Alexander Bradley, who was shot once by a semi-automatic handgun. Florida authorities recovered a single spent shell casing at that scene. End quote. I mean, do I really got a way in here? Pretty self-explanatory, right? I mean, there is some, I guess it's speculation if you want to call it that. But as far as evidence is concerned, considering the factors surrounding these two incidences, the, the double homicide and the Alexander Bradley shooting, coincidence, maybe, uh, highly unlikely. Seems like it's pretty spot on and it does represent something in his life. And it happens to be that he's allegedly connected to these two incidences that involve these types of firearms. I think that's pretty compelling in the, in a court of law. I typically don't like to use things like this, like tattoos and stuff in a court of law. Um, and I think that obviously you need other pieces of evidence to support this like you can't just go in with the tattoo and be like there you go case closed however like you said it, could it be a coincidence it would be a crazy coincidence so for me just as the average person it's incredibly compelling to suggest that aaron hernandez was responsible for both of these um attacks both of these crimes and I'm not sure why he would get tattoos to represent that. You know, maybe it makes him feel kind of more legitimate as like the street guy that he wants to be. And and this makes I, I don't understand. Once again, he's a, a professional football player 
these are tattoos that you would see on like a guy in prison. So I'm not sure what his That's aim was. Yeah. That's just it. It's a badge of honor. Just like you see the teardrops on people's eyes when they've committed homicides. You know, they, they, they do it to show off a badge of honor to the people who are in that same that same world to understand without any words that they got a couple bodies on on their record that they've been uh, they've been responsible for the death of others i think he wanted people to know that and the people in his in that world would understand those tattoos just by watching him on tv there wouldn't need to be words they would understand the tattoos for what they represent yeah but then don't you think that everyone else who just thinks he's aaron hernandez all american football player guy is going to look at those tattoos and be like ugh why what's that about you know I mean, it's possible, but I don't think he was doing it for them. He had so many tattoos on his body. They almost looked like from far away on TV. It just looked like his whole arm was painted with tattoos. You couldn't really see what they were unless you were up close. Uh, So I don't think he really cared about the perception from, you know, the viewers or the fans. To them, it would just look like he's covered his body in tattoos and there would really be no significance to the individual tattoos themselves. But you did say something earlier and it's very important. We're not just pinning this stuff on him because of tattoos. It's the totality of circumstances, right? A lot of circumstantial evidence, including uh, witnesses stating that he was there and that he did it. So that in conjunction with the tattoos is very compelling and maybe the thing that tips the scale when it comes to a jury. So the tattoos for him, you're saying or you think is just this like sign of belongingness into this world that he desperately wanted to be a part of. Yeah, it's a gang member mentality. They like to memorialize the things that they've done, events in their lives where they've earned their stripes, so to speak. They memorialize that by putting it on their bodies. And God forgives written backwards. So he's also That's saying- That's his justification. He's forgiven for this. Yep. I don't care what you think. God forgives. That's okay. all. That's the, only, that's the only power that I'm answering to. Pretty gross. The same day that Aaron sent money to Florida for the purchase of two guns, he was texting with Alexander Bradley again. Bradley sent Aaron a message saying, quote, Do you have trustworthy N-words like me around? Doubt it, dog. Six strong with a lot of weaponry. So, hey, you turned this convo into this. End quote. Aaron responded, quote, If you ever got me in trouble or ruined my life for something I didn't do, I don't even want to get back at you, but you will pay. I'll be back around the way in a couple of months, too, and I can't wait to see you because I see you still be at your baby mother's crib a bunch. Love you, cuz. Can't stop loving someone that was the only person I fucked with and was like a brother to me. But damn, you are trying to sue me for something I didn't do and don't even know about. If you could win that, even God is on your side. But I doubt something can be proved that isn't true. End quote. So... Do you think Aaron was subtly threatening Alexander Bradley by saying like, oh, I'll be around in a couple months and I I know you're still hanging at your girl's house and I can't wait to see you and all of that because like I do. (laughs) Yeah, I I think you're right. I do agree. I think he was being passive in his threat because he knew it was recorded in the text. But this kind of reinstills in me that there might have been something, maybe a phone conversation, maybe something Aaron heard through friends and associates of Mr. Bradley that Bradley was after money initially. You know, he wanted to be compensated for what happened. And it almost sounds like that in this text where Bradley's saying, hey, you turned it into this. Now it's about blood. And that's where Aaron kind of read between the lines where he's like, oh, you got people around you. OK, well, you know where I am. I know where you are, too. So as much as you can get to me, I can get to you. Keep that in mind. So there wasn't a legitimate and actual lawsuit at this point that would come later. And um, I honestly... This is my opinion. I don't think that Alexander Bradley ever truly did want to make it legal because if he did, why is he seeing these things in text? You know, like six strong with all the weaponry. No, he wanted to be paid off on the side. Yeah. Yeah. He wanted a ch- he wanted cash. He wanted a duffel bag full of cash and then it would have been squashed. That would have been the end of it. Which at that point, if you're Aaron Hernandez, like give him the duffel bag full of cash. You shot him in the face, allegedly. And if that's going to like get you, you know, to a place where you feel safe and you don't feel like you got to run and hide to California, then like give him the money if that's if that's it. But he may have also been so paranoid. He's thinking, well, this extortion is just never going to stop. Like he'll, he'll be wanting more later. I don't know what's going through his head. He also could see it as an admission of guilt. Like this could be a setup where. The cops are in on this. And as soon as Aaron drops the duffel bag, they arrest him for attempted murder, you know, because he's trying to pay off a way. Who knows? Who knows what was going through his head? But these are all thoughts that I'm sure 
were running through his mind as he was considering what was the best option for him? Well, Alexander Bradley seemed to think that Aaron was threatening him. And like I said, I definitely do, too, because he went on to say, quote, here you go, threaten again. You know that you don't scare me, though. If you knew how G'd up I am, you wouldn't even say that, end quote. What does G'd up mean? It doesn't mean like I've got guns, I've got people, like I have... Nah. He's got his co- he's got his crew with him. He's got so many dudes around him. He's G'd up. He's got his G's with him and and they're 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 rolling deep. He's got a lot of people around him. Okay. So according to James Patterson's book, All American Murderer, Bradley then went on to tell Aaron that he had several guns, four bulletproof vests, and plenty of friends who knew how to use these things, writing, quote, if you think them wolves ain't on deck, then try what you gotta try. End quote. This is so ridiculous. This is so ridiculous that grown men are having this kind of conversation. In text. (laughs) No, exactly. Like, (laughs) what what are we doing here? What are we doing doing here? here? (laughs) So from California, Aaron got in touch with his private security guard, Bo Wallace, who um, was in Florida at this point. And he had Bo place an order for a used armored Ford Expedition to the tune of $120,000. And while all of this is happening, Aaron is communicating with people from his regular life, people like Tim Tebow, who texted him on April 10th, saying he was sorry that Aaron was unable to make it to his annual charity event in Florida. Aaron said he had just had surgery and he didn't feel like he should be flying. Now, in fact, Aaron did have surgery on March 27th to repair his shoulder, which had been injured during a game. And... You know, so that was true. But the whole I don't think I should be flying thing, not really true. And, you know, as casual and happy go lucky as could be, Aaron responded to Tim Tebow, quote, yes, would have been great to catch up. And I'm sure I'll be there next season. But no reason why we can't catch up sometime if you wanted. Love you and hope everything works out for you at the event. End quote. He's like in, in conversations with Alexander Bradley, he's over here like completely using like you know gang lingo and talking completely differently and when he's talking to tim tebow or people from like his professional life he's all like cannot wait to see you love you hope everything works out for you it's just so crazy to me Mm, double life like you said earlier Two days later, Aaron was communicating via text with his financial advisor, Steve Vojevich, who gave him the good news that Aaron's bank account was now up to $4.4 million. And Aaron responded with, quote, that's tight, and I get 500 k for workout bonus, end quote. This 23-year-old young man was truly living a double life, and it really stresses me out to think about the effort that it must have taken to keep both of his faces on at the same time all the time. Like at any point he could get a text from Alexander Bradley talking about being G'd up and the wolves are on deck and he's got to slip into like street mode. And then he's getting a text from Tim Tebow about a charity event and he's got to slip into like professional football player mode. And it feels exhausting, exhausting. I can only imagine that's why the guy was probably self-medicating on marijuana and doing all these other things to try to take his, his mind off of it because what a way to live, right? When you can't put your head on your pillow and get a good night's sleep because that could be the night when the retaliation happens. And and let's be honest, like obviously Bradley was his biggest issue at that point, but this isn't the first person he's crossed. He's, he knows what he's done in the past if he did it. And so he has to know that there could be someone out there, a sibling, a cousin of one of these other individuals who also knows he was involved and is not going to go to the police. And so everywhere he goes, even the people he's unaware of, he has to constantly be on alert for that person who may be looking to, you know, carry out the retaliation for a loved one that Aaron had was responsible for taking from them. Well, I can tell you, like I've experienced a little taste of this where uh, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but some some sort of high profile people have been sort of coming after me. And when we were in Vegas and I no, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. When we were when I but we were in Vegas and I was on public, I was like constantly paranoid when people would come up and talk to me. And I was like, is this a person from like these people? Like, who is this? Like, is this someone I can trust? Is this someone that I need to be like worried about? And it makes you con- like constantly looking over your shoulder, constantly stressed out, not really wanting to talk to anybody, not really feeling safe no matter where you are. And at the end of the day, who was the real Aaron Hernandez? He didn't even know, I think. I don't think he knew who he really was. I think he was so twisted inside that he didn't know who he was. And that is mentally and emotionally taxing. And it can drive you crazy. Absolutely. Derek said, I don't want to talk about it. (laughs) 
yeah, no, I'm not going there. I was involved in some of those conversations at the meeting. I'm like, listen, I only work with her. Let me move away. <laughs> He's like, I don't really like her that much. You know what? I'm not attached. I'm like, whatever, you know. <laughs> nah, we ain't scared Just over here. Moving yourself away from me physically. <laughs> Derek, you want to go to dinner? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm going to go to sleep. All right. So on Memorial Day weekend, Aaron threw a big party at his North Attleboro home for his fiance Shayana's 24th birthday party. And as he flipped burgers on the grill, just like his father Dennis had once done during his own family gatherings, family members and friends streamed into the house and enjoyed the swimming pool. In attendance was Aaron's brother DJ, Shayana's little sister Shania, and her boyfriend Odin Lloyd. Now, after the daytime activities commenced, a bunch of the guests, including Odin Lloyd, got into a party bus, which drove them to Rumor Nightclub in Boston, where they drank and danced until the club closed at 2 a.m. For the next few weeks, Aaron and Odin would hang out quite a bit, sometimes with their significant others, sometimes without them. According to Lloyd's friends, his friendship with Aaron had given him a glimpse into the good life, the life he would have loved to provide for himself and his family. Daryl Hodge, a close friend of Odin Lloyd's, told ESPN that Lloyd was talking to him about this kind of dream where he could wake up every day and get paid millions to do what he loved to do, which was play football. And Aaron was bringing Lloyd into a lifestyle that Lloyd had never really imagined he could live. He was giving him tickets to Patriots game, dropping upwards of $10,000 a night at clubs and telling Lloyd, like, oh, you have never been to California. You know, I'm going to I'm going to bring you to California with me. We're going to go to places like Miami. Like, we're going to have a great time. Similarly to how he was doing with Alexander Bradley, where he sort of brought Bradley into his life. And then all of a sudden he's flying him all over the place. Bradley's getting bottle service. And and, you know, Aaron kind of promised Odin that this was going to be like his life and Odin's going to marry Shania and they're all going to be this big, happy family. And Odin's going to get to experience all of this stuff that he always wanted vicariously through Aaron just by being a part of his circle and a part of his family. Yeah, that's right. He, you know, obviously he wanted to play football for a living, but he also wanted the things that came with being a professional football player. And as you said, uh, he probably wasn't going to make the league if he hadn't at this point. And this was an opportunity for him to live that lifestyle without actually having to be on a professional field. Now, at this point, Odin Lloyd didn't have a car. He biked to work every day. And this was obviously because he couldn't afford a vehicle. But he also thought that the daily exercise would give him an advantage while playing on the field with the bandits. But suddenly, on the weekend of June 14th, Odin was driving around in a shiny black Chevy Suburban that Aaron Hernandez had rented him. And Aaron told Odin that he could use the car until Monday. It was also the night of Saturday, June 15th, that Lloyd went to rumor again with Aaron and a friend of Aaron's named Robbie Oliveras, who was also Aaron's barber, and a man named Kwame Nicholas, who was a friend of Odin Lloyd's. Now, maybe Aaron was blowing off steam that night, since two days before, on June 13th, Alexander Bradley had filed a lawsuit against him for the shooting. Everything was going fine at rumor. And Aaron asked a young woman named Casey Arma to dance. But suddenly, his demeanor took a 180. Is it more than dirty dancing? For prosecutors, it suggests motive. Aaron Hernandez standing against a wall while a female dance partner does a bump and grind. He told me his name was Rock. It's two nights before Odin Lloyd is killed. He's in a club with Hernandez. Club promoter Casey Arma testifies Hernandez asks her to dance, and she does. Then his mood suddenly takes a turn. He seemed irritated and kind of just aggressive. He just seemed a lot more agitated, like on edge. Another witness also tells jurors he sees Hernandez appearing angry inside the club as Lloyd talks to a friend, and angry again when Hernandez leaves the club, his right arm gesturing in the air. So for those of you who were just listening and you couldn't see if you're not watching on YouTube, there's a clip, a security footage from Rumor and Aaron is in the top left corner and he's dancing with this girl. His back's to the wall and she's kind of like grinding on him. And then all of a sudden he sort of like abruptly kind of pushes her away and walks away from the wall. And he's like kind of raising his arms sort of like what's going on just to give you an indication of what happened in that clip. 
According to Casey Arna, she and Aaron were dancing for roughly 5 to 10 minutes before he abruptly took off. When he returned 10 minutes later, she testified that his mood had changed from relaxed to annoyed and he had pulled her back out onto the dance floor very aggressively. Um, there was other allegations she made. He, he, She said he like grabbed her and like kind of looked at her butt and he was like, show me what that thing can do and, and all of this stuff. And he was kind of getting like just very aggressive and, and not so polite anymore. And um, at some point, Aaron goes outside with Odin Lloyd, and this is also captured on surveillance, and they're having some sort of discussion that seems to be animated. Aaron's arms are like waving around and they seem to be kind of having an argument. And then they both go back inside the club and then they go to like separate groups of people. So they're not really hanging out in the club after that. Now, when the bar closed and the patrons were streaming out into the street, Casey Arna saw Aaron again and she said he was, quote, pacing back and forth on the street corner, end quote. Kwame Nicholas, Odin's friend, testified that while Aaron and Casey Arna were dancing, Aaron had spotted Odin Lloyd, who was talking to a group of people, and he began to stare at Lloyd in a menacing way. Now, to this day, we don't know what upset Aaron or why he became angry with Odin Lloyd that night. But of course, there's been speculation both in court and just amongst, you know, people. It's believed that whoever Odin Lloyd was talking to in the club were people that Aaron did not want him to talk to for whatever reason. Maybe Aaron thought they were associated in some way with Daniel Diabreo and Sefiro Furtado, the victims from that double homicide in Boston. By the time the club closed, Aaron and Odin seemed to have settled their disagreement and they left together. After leaving the club, Aaron stopped to pick up two women who were walking back to their car in Boston's theater district after leaving a different club. Now, these two women were Jennifer Fortier, the nanny of Aaron's infant daughter, and Jennifer's friend Amanda. Jennifer claims that a black SUV pulled up next to them, Aaron was driving, Odin Lloyd was in the passenger seat, and Aaron's friend Robbie Oliveras was in the back seat. Aaron told the two women to get in, and initially they thought that he was going to drive them back to their car, but instead Aaron continued driving to North Attleboro as all three men smoked weed and blasted music in the car. Jennifer claimed that Aaron dropped Robbie off a few streets away from Aaron's own home, and Aaron told Robbie to walk to his parked car, which he had left near Aaron's house, because Aaron did not want Shiana to see him with Jennifer. And then Aaron drove himself, Amanda, and Odin to his flop house apartment in Franklin. Instead of dropping her off, Hernandez kept driving. I kept telling him I needed to leave because I was a babysitter and I wasn't comfortable. And, and did he say something in response to that? That it was okay. Odin Lloyd and Jennifer's best friend were also in the SUV. They all ended up at Hernandez's so-called flop house in Franklin. Tried kissing me. And what happened when he uh, tried to kiss you? He kissed me and I pushed him away and told him, no, I'm your nanny, like, I can't do this. Okay, what did he say to that? He said he understood and that it was okay and he wasn't mad at me. You never felt threatened or scared while those men were smoking and driving, did you? No. And indeed, everyone in the car was in good spirits, weren't they? Yes. Yeah, this all seems pretty self-explanatory so far based on everything we discussed. And even to elaborate, just to go back for a second on that, the footage from the club. In the last second of that clip, you do see Aaron kind of signal with his hand, his right hand, if you're listening on audio, where he's kind of like signaling to someone or trying to get someone's attention. So based on what you laid out as a possible reason for it, it does make sense because he did seem like he was into the girl that was dancing on him. And then all of a sudden, as you see in the clip, it just he like totally walks away from her and is like signaling to someone. So what other reason would it be uh, other than seeing Odin Lloyd? or seeing someone he's with or who he's someone he's paranoid about. Right. And I mean, there's a lot of speculation. We don't know. We don't know. But I think it's very important right. to understand that somebody who's paranoid like Aaron was at that moment, it doesn't have to be anything that actually happened, right? Like he's thinking that every guy with a buzz cut in a bar is a cop. So he can see something completely benign and put his own meaning to it. And then he's spiraling. But that's why it's important, right? Because this could be the first chink in the armor of Odin Lloyd, where this is the first moment where Aaron says, I don't think I can trust this guy. Is he a, is he someone working for the other side? Is this someone I should be really frequenting with? Like, I, I wanted to hang out with him, but now 
I'm questioning the fact that I'm associating with him. And this might have been that first moment where he started to change his his perception of Odin Lloyd. It could have even been like, oh, wait, this Odin Lloyd dude shows up in my life out of all of a sudden out of nowhere, you know, and like, is he affiliated with these guys that I shot in Boston? Allegedly. Now, he was found not guilty of that. Right. So, you know, let's let's just have that out there. I think he did it. That's my personal opinion. But uh, he could be thinking that this that the Odin Lloyd's associated with them and he somehow like infiltrated his way into Aaron's life to get close to him. And it's just it doesn't make any sense. It's not logical, but he's not in a logical place at this point. That's right. Or or is Odin affiliated with Alexander Bradley somehow? You right. Know, could he be setting him up? Who knows what's running through his head? Well, after his advances on Jennifer were rejected, Aaron fell asleep and Jennifer and Amanda called a cab to bring them to the W Hotel in Boston where they had parked their car. The next morning, Aaron sent a text to his fiance at 8.57 a.m. saying, quote, I fucked up again and fuck, I didn't mean to, but got drunk and too fucked up and oh, took care of me and somehow told him about my other spot, and I just woke up bugging. I'm sorry, and on my way home, end quote. Um, so when he says, oh, took care of me, he means Odin. Obviously, he's not telling Shyana that he had two women there with him. He's just saying, oh, I got too drunk, No. and Odin had to take care of me. But he does say something in this text that stood out to me, somehow told him about my other spot. It's almost like Aaron wanted to keep that apartment a secret from people he did not trust, specifically men he did not trust. So like he would have um, the guys from from his Aunt Tanya's house there because those were people he trusted and who were protecting him, who he was paying to protect him. But to bring somebody like Odin Lloyd there, who he didn't know that well. And at this point, he may be suspecting him of doing something or being involved with something that he doesn't want him to be involved with. It may almost have seemed like now am I safe because now maybe people know about this place too. I unfortunately had this incident at the club where now I'm rethinking, you know, my relationship with Odin. And on top of that, because I was drunk, I just told him where I laid my head at night. Now, if someone does want to get to me, they know where I'll be. And Odin Lloyd's the leak. That could be what he's thinking at that point. Let's take our last break and we'll be right back. Did you know that nearly 90% of people are nutrient deficient? There's a misconception that if we eat healthy, our body doesn't need anything extra. But our food system today is broken. So even with a well-rounded diet, it's impossible to get all the nutrition you need. But Gem solves this issue with daily nutrition in one delicious bite made from 100% real food ingredients. The Gem Bite is your first true non-synthetic multivitamin alternative featuring only plant ingredients and delivering over 15 key vitamins, minerals, and herbs for energy, mood, focus, and beauty. Your daily nutrition in one delicious bite. Gem isn't a pill. It's perfect for anyone that may have difficulty swallowing pills. It's a tasty bite that's concentrated blend of superfoods, herbs, probiotics, prebiotics, and algae that are often not found in the average multivitamin. And Gem ingredients are designed to work together in perfect synergy. Each bite is more than the sum of its parts to help boost mood, energy, brain function, and more. Best of all, Gem is truly delicious. You can choose from an array of tasty flavors that best fit your preference. And unlike other vitamins, there's no mega doses or synthetic fillers. Gem provides just the right amount to fill your nutrient gaps, nothing more and nothing less. Gem is actually backed by science. Their scientific advisory board is a mix of the brightest leaders in medical, nutritional, and holistic medicine. And honestly, I got my Gem, uh, my Gem bites last month, and I think they taste good. And I have been feeling a lot more energetic, and I've honestly been drinking more water when when I'm having them, which I'm not sure if that's a side effect of it, but I've been feeling healthier, cleaner. I've been drinking more water and drinking less things that aren't super good for me. So you guys should try Gem out for yourself. And Derek's going to tell you how. Yeah. You, not only should you try it out, but right now you got a really good discount. So you can get 30% off your first order when you go to dailygem.co slash weekly. That's dailygem.co slash weekly to get 30% off your first order. One more time dailygem.co slash weekly for 30% off. Really good deal if you want to try it out. Give them a shot. Mm -hmm. 
So this whole incident on this evening, it led some people to believe that maybe Aaron was worried that Odin would tell his girlfriend, who was Shayana's sister, that Aaron had picked up two women on the side of the road and brought them back to his apartment. Now, there's also people who believe that Aaron was attracted to both men and women. We talked about that briefly in prior episodes, and maybe at some point, Aaron had made a pass at Odin Lloyd or Lloyd had seen him make a pass at another man. So he kind of knew something about Aaron that Aaron wouldn't want to get out. It could have also been, like I said, that Aaron was so paranoid at this point, so suspicious of everyone and everything. Odin could have said or done something completely innocent during a conversation that Aaron took the wrong way, that he took as sort of a threat or a veiled threat. The two men were often high and or drunk when they were together, and a great deal of marijuana can cause extreme paranoia. And for someone who's already paranoid, this could have been a very bad situation. No, I agree. And and you know what? It could be as simple as Odin Lloyd is uh, dating his fiance's sister. And there's no secret. Aaron has a a child with Shayana and and. If Cheyenne decided to take him to court, she would be entitled to a lot because of the child. And so it could be as simple as that, where he's doing things behind closed doors, including uh, having a second home. So Cheyenne is not is not knowing about his extracurricular activities. And now Odin, who's ultimately loyal to his girlfriend, could confide in her and she could tell Cheyenne. So it could ruin his whole thing that he's got going. It could be as simple and as surface level as that, where he's cheating on his girl who he has a child with and doesn't want to be financially responsible for something because Cheyenne decides to leave and take him for half his money. It could have even been that, you know, Odin might not necessarily like confide in Shania, but accidentally let something slip, you know, not meaning to, but let something slip. And Aaron could not have that possibility. Aaron couldn't let that potential be out there. And I mean, this was just after hanging out together for a short time. What's going to happen after they've been together and sort of like brothers for a year, two years, three years, and Odin's kind of privy to all of these things Aaron's doing behind the scene. Like, just by the law of averages, Odin's going to accidentally let something slip to his girlfriend or fiance or wife at one point at at this time that they all spend together. And Aaron's going to get caught up. It's happened a million times to a million people. It almost sounds like, from what Aaron texted to Shayana, that this was the first time Odin had been brought to this new location. Right. And so up to this point, it might have been something where they were associates, they were they were friends, but they were friends through association of their sis of the sisters. And Aaron probably was conducting this type of activity on a regular basis with his closer friends. And he kind of brought Odin into that world that night at the club and then afterwards, where now that relationship between those two individuals has gone further than it has in the past, where they were associates, they both knew like, hey, We have something in common, our, you know, our significant others, our sisters. But now he crossed over into the friend level where it's like, hey, I'm trusting you that I'm cheating on her and now you know about it. And maybe because he was intoxicated, he wanted to keep that boundary and he crossed it because of what he was trying to accomplish that night, right? He was, he had a goal, he had an agenda according to the nanny and he didn't really care who was with him. And because it probably didn't, pan out the way he had hoped by sleeping with the nanny, he was really regretting it. Like, man, I just gave up this whole other life that I'm conducting to a dude I really don't trust. And I didn't even, I didn't even accomplish what I wanted, which was to have sex with this woman. So he's really waking up with some, with some regret. And he's trying to get ahead of it almost by telling Shayana. That's what it sounded like to me. Exactly. And it, it didn't sound like it was the first time he had messed up and stayed out all night. Right. And she's already knowing that he's been with other women that he's stepped out on their relationship before. And I'm sure there was a conversation where she was like, Aaron, this cannot happen again. We have a baby now. Like we have a life. We have to be a family. You can't be doing this again. So he's over here like, oh, shit, not only did I do it again, but now there's a witness. And this witness happens to, you know, (laughs) maybe have some loyalty to somebody who has some loyalty to my fiance. And this is a bad position for me to be in. And maybe I just need to eliminate this threat so that I can breathe again. It would make sense. Sometimes a simple explanation is the right one, right? Everyone's got all these theories. It could be as simple as that. Yeah, because you have to understand at this point, if what we think to be true is true, Aaron's already gotten away with murder. And uh, he doesn't seem to value human life that much. You know, he, he seems to think of himself as above others and other people around him are expendable. They're there to be used 
And if he's done using them or he can't use them, then he doesn't care what happens to them. So he may solve his problems like this. I mean, how else is he going to solve the problem? He can tell Odin Lloyd, like, hey, don't tell your girlfriend. But Odin Lloyd's only human. He might let it slip. He might tell her purposely or accidentally. And Aaron just can't take that risk. On Father's Day, June 16th, 2013, Odin Lloyd was still driving around in the black suburban that Aaron had rented for him. Odin Lloyd is cruising with his friends in that mysterious black suburban. We had the music playing, we were jamming to the music and stuff. We're laughing, we're talking. Odin driving, got a, the one hand type driving, like he's, he's just having fun. Later, when we went to my aunt's house, he was playing pool. Over the table, over the table, over the bar. I've seen Odin make one of the most spectacular shots I've ever seen. You have no chance in hell. It was a good day. Oh, it was, it was a great day. You got that? I, I hope y'all got that on. A great day. And it was coming to an end after Lloyd got a text from his job saying he had to work the next morning. Then he got another text asking to hang out. A text from Hernandez. Yeah, the text alluded to just, let's have another great night. I take it there was a part of you that thought, man, you gotta go to work the next day. Go home. Yeah, I was like, it's already like nine, nine-ish. So when you guys left each other, what do you remember saying to him? <laughs> I'm gonna see you later. Little did he know, there would be no later. Earlier that day, Aaron had gotten a text from his agent, Brian Murphy, and Murphy had informed him that Alexander Bradley had agreed to withdraw the lawsuit so that they could have settlement talks without anything getting to the media or the public. Murphy referred to this new development as, quote, a big win for us, end quote. That night, Aaron Hernandez texted Odin Lloyd, quote, I'm coming to grab that tonight. You gonna be around? I need that, and we could step for a little again, end quote. Two minutes after sending that text, Aaron sent another text to his friend and personal security detail, Ernest Bo Wallace, asking him to, quote, please make it back because I'm definitely trying to step for a little, end quote. Now, Odin had responded to Aaron asking him where, and Aaron responded, quote, I don't know, it don't matter, but I'm going to hit you when I'm that way like last time. If my phone dies, I'm going to hit you when I charge it, which will be in a little, end quote. A minute later, after that, Aaron texted Ernest Wallace again, telling him to get his ass up there. Now, at that time, Ernest Wallace and another friend of Aaron's, Carlos Ortiz, were at Aaron's cousin, Tanya Singleton's house in Bristol, which was 100 miles southwest of North Attleboro. It seemed like Aaron could not give Odin Lloyd further details of when they were meeting up that night until he knew that his backup, Wallace and Ortiz, were actually on their way to him because Odin texted Aaron again right around midnight asking if they were still on. Eight minutes after this text, surveillance footage from Aaron's home shows Ernest Wallace and Carlos Ortiz pulling up to Aaron's house. They were let into the house by the babysitter, Jennifer Fortier, and they went down into the basement to wait for Aaron to get home since he was out with Shayana at this time. Video shows him light up and take a drag in the driveway before leaving. While he was gone with his fiance, his two alleged accomplices came to his home at midnight, Ernest Wallace and Carlos Ortiz. When Hernandez returned, he walked right by with what looks like it could be a gun. Minutes later, he was picking up his daughter, and after that affectionate moment, he and his two accomplices left in a silver Nissan rental. I'll say this before we continue. If you're listening on audio, whether it's through us or you go look it up on your own, you really need to go look at this footage. Not only this clip, but the other clips that we're going to be playing, not only tonight, but probably next week. They're very compelling. We talk about tattoos and things like that and how that's circumstantial. This stuff is a lot more compelling. This is what you know, prosecution is really going to base their case on, as they should. Just to kind of describe the video for you, it's exactly how the narrator just explained it. But to me, I don't know how you feel, Stephanie, it does look like he's got a gun in his hand at that point. So when we think about what's going to happen later this evening on this date, to see him with a gun in his home only hours before, um, not good if you're trying to create a defense. I would say 100% it looks like a gun. I'm not sure what else it could be. 
it's like too big to be a cell phone. You know, it's gun shaped. Right. <laughs> so we don't want to get ahead, but did they ever? They recovered the firearm, correct? No. Or a firearm? No. Okay. No. Because I'll tell you, this is going out on a limb here. I have nothing to substantiate this, but I'm pretty familiar with firearms, and it does look like a Glock to me, and that is important because Glocks, as we know in in the law enforcement field, they're a lot harder to trace. There's a firing pin on the back of the firearm that that basically hits the back of the shell casing of the of the bullet. And with Glocks, it's harder to trace it back to a single Glock. That's why a lot of uh, individuals who are committing crimes use that that firearm because the firing pin indentation um, could be slightly different. Where with a lot of firearms, they can replicate that same firearm pin indentation over and over again. So they can basically, if they find a gun in question, they can shoot it, uh, obtain the shell casings from that controlled shooting. And then compare them to the shell casing recovered at the crime scene. And by comparing the shell casings recovered at the crime scene to the shell casings fired in that control environment, they can compare the shell casing indentations and they can also compare the striations on the side of the shell casings, which is usually what you'll see. Like the striations would be imperfections caused by the extraction of that shell casing from the gun. And under a microscope, they can actually compare the two. And come up with a reasonable degree of certainty whether or not that gun was the same gun that fired the shell casings recovered at the scene. With a Glock, that's a lot harder to do. That's why that's the weapon of choice. Well, they never found that gun because somebody got rid of it for him, allegedly. Mm -hmm. Allegedly. Uh, so Aaron, Carlos, and Ernest, they left the house around 1.09 a.m. They got into a silver Nissan Altima that Aaron had rented. Between 1.22 a.m. and 2.32 a.m. on January 17th, this is obviously the early morning hours of January 17th, Odin Lloyd's phone received five calls from a number that was later traced back to a cell phone used by Ernest Bo Wallace. And at around 2 a.m., Aaron, Ernest, and Carlos stopped at the Blue Hill Express service station on Route 138 in Canton, Massachusetts. And this was a gas station that was on the way from Aaron's house to Odin Lloyd's home in Dorchester. It was just about a half an hour away from Odin's place. The Ultima pulled up to a pump, and this is when the gas station surveillance video uh, caught Aaron dancing in the parking lot. Our first look at Aaron Hernandez shortly before the murder of Odin Lloyd. Authorities say that is Carlos Ortiz, one of his co-defendants with him. Hernandez at one point corrals Ortiz and pushes him back into the rented Nissan Altima and then does it again. Hernandez then walks toward the convenience store, dancing as he goes. Ortiz exits the car and follows. The two purchase bubble gum and cigars inside and then walk back outside. Hernandez dancing again, apparently bantering with Ortiz. They leave the station at 2.12 a.m. headed toward Odin Lloyd, consistent with the state's timeline of the crime. Such odd behavior. And I don't, you know, I almost wonder if they were extremely intoxicated that night. It seemed like, yeah, Aaron was definitely under the influence of something. They were extremely intoxicated. They'd had quite a bit to drink. Obviously, I think they were probably high. I mean, there's no proof of that, but the, Aaron was always high. So, yeah. A, a, a mixture that makes you pretty much not care about anything that's happening. Aaron doesn't come across as the guy who's dancing in parking lots under normal circumstances. Just my just my hunch. But normal circumstances for Aaron, I feel like, is he's drunk and high all the time. So very true. But even at the club that night, when you go, we go back to that clip where I'm assuming he was drinking that night. You know, he's a, this you know woman that he's attracted to that he calls over and she's dancing and he doesn't he doesn't move a hip. He, didn't, he just literally put his hand up. So it takes a lot for him to get up and dance. But apparently the the gas station was was the was the scene that night. Nah, because at the club, there's a bunch of people around that are like wild cards. Who are they? What are they doing? Are they trying me? But in the gas station parking lot, it's just him and his buddies. He can be himself. He can be free. That's right. He can move with the music. So, yeah. The gas station music. The gas station music. Club 7-Eleven. Like, it's like the soft rock, like Phil Collins. <laughs> Listening to some sick beats. <laughs> sick beats, yeah. <laughs> so an employee at the gas station, Juan Farhan, would testify that Aaron Hernandez had purchased a black and mild cigar as well as a pack of blue bubblegum, the blue bubblicious gum. And this gum will become important later. 
At 2.33 a.m., surveillance video from a home across the street from Lloyd's Dorchester house on Feaston Street showed Odin Lloyd getting into that same silver Nissan Altima and pulling away. Odin Lloyd's sister witnessed her brother get into this vehicle as well, and she and Odin texted back and forth as he rode in that car towards the location where his lifeless body would later be found. Shaquilla DeBeau testified she saw her brother get into the Altima that allegedly drove him to his death. Did you see him go somewhere else? Yes, he got into the back passenger seat. Thibault also texted Odin Lloyd multiple times that night, including just minutes before the murder. A text message from the number that you uh, recognize your brother, a text came back to you, yes or no? Yes. And then a minute after that, another text at 3.23 a.m. came in from a number that you recognize as your brother Odin Lloyd's. Yes. It is possible that Odin Lloyd knew that he was in trouble, given the contents of the text messages he sent his sister. At 3.07 a.m., Odin texted his sister, quote, you saw who I'm with, end quote. At 3.11 a.m., Odin texted her again, saying, quote, hello, end quote. At 3.19, Odin's sister texted back, saying, quote, my phone was dead. Who was that? End quote. And Odin responded, quote, NFL, end quote. At 3.22, his sister texted Odin, quote, L. At 3.22, his sister texted Odin, quote, LOL, you're Aggie, end quote. And she testified that this meant Odin was aggravating her. Odin sent his last text to his sister at 3.23 a.m., and that text message said, quote, just so you know, end quote. And I definitely agree that Odin was texting his sister these things because he felt something was off. He felt that he might be in danger. I've sent a few of these texts myself, not necessarily because of like who I'm with, but maybe because of where I am. You know, if I'm younger, I'm going to a certain house party. I'm like, just so you know, I'm with this person. I'm going to this party just to be safe, maybe because you feel it's not the safest situation, but you're young and, and you just do things <laughs> even knowing that you don't feel completely right about them. Now, during the trial, a Sprint yeah. employee named Ricardo Leal testified that several texts which showed in Aaron's cell phone records had been deleted off the phone. And these messages indicated an urgency and a desperate need from Aaron for Ernest Bo Wallace to be in North Attleboro on the night of June 16th, going into the early morning of June 17th. Tracking data from both Aaron and Odin's cell phones showed that they both traveled together from Odin's home to the industrial park in North Attleboro, where Odin would be shot. And among those cell sites that pinged on the phones was one near the interchange of the Mass Turnpike and Route 128 at around 2.53 a.m., where Aaron sped through a toll plaza without paying. The next time the phones pinged, they were both at that industrial park, just half a mile from Aaron's home, where his fiancé and baby daughter were soundly sleeping. It's believed that Odin Lloyd was shot to death here, at around 3.25 a.m. During the trial, Dr. William Zane, who had performed Odin's autopsy, detailed the gunshot wounds that had taken his life. He had been shot six times in his chest, clavicle, right arm, and back. Three of those gunshot wounds would have caused death within seconds to minutes, based on damage to Odin's internal organs. The murder weapon would have been a Glock 45 caliber handgun, a weapon that has never been found, but one that prosecutors believe looked like the gun Aaron was seen holding on surveillance footage both before and after the murder of Odin Lloyd. Aaron, Ernest Wallace, and Carlos Ortiz were seen on Aaron's home security system arriving back to the house around 3.27 a.m. Despite having picked up Odin Lloyd at 2.23, only three people returned to Aaron Hernandez's house. Aaron Hernandez, Ernest Wallace, and Carlos Ortiz. The defendant inputs the code into the overhead garage door opener. The three of them got quickly, before the door is even completely open, into the garage. The defendant leads them through the house, telling them to be quiet. Ernest Wallace and Carlos Ortiz initially go down to the basement. Over the next few minutes, you'll see uh, during the course of the trial on the video surveillance, the defendant is, is uh, moving around, comes down from the first floor into the basement, moving around on the first floor. And you will see, ladies and gentlemen, the defendant standing outside of the entrance to his basement 
holding a gun. Of course, in this trial, you'll hear from a representative of the law. He'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that that appearance is unique. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a law. So, I mean, you spotted it right away, even before they said that. You said it looks like he's holding a Glock. Yeah, I carried a Glock for 13 years as a police officer, so very familiar with it. And it's something that when we pulled guns off the street, specifically from gang members, it was the weapon of choice when when available because for the reasons I laid out earlier. And and I said it at the beginning, I'll say it again, If you if you haven't seen these videos, you should definitely go watch them. They're going to give you a whole different dimension to Aaron Hernandez and the, we have to say alleged, but his possible involvement with this crime, because it's very clear in this still photo that they're showing at the end of this clip, there's no doubt it's a gun that he's holding. Um, I don't think anybody, whether you have a familiarity with firearms or not, you may not be able to identify it as a Glock, but I think it's all safe to say it's a gun, right? Do you agree with that? I mean, it's it's a gun that he's holding. Yeah, for sure. And I don't think we even have to say alleged in this scenario because he was found not guilty of the double murder in, That's right. in Boston, but he was found guilty of Odin Lloyd's murder. And I mean, just based on, it, there's a plethora of evidence we're going to talk about next episode that they found at the scene, that they found in their rental car. I mean, it's like... Aaron it's did overwhelming. Yeah, Aaron did very little to cover his tracks. He was either that out of it or that entitled and and thought he was untouchable i'm not sure which but just the timeline you see him on surveillance picking odin up and then you see him on surveillance roughly an hour later coming home without odin where's odin odin's going to be found dead the last person who he talked to and the last person who he was with was aaron hernandez and i mean it's very very easy to understand why he was found guilty of this that's right yeah no it was it was pretty slam dunk there are you know he made uh his defense was that the other individuals may have possibly done it you know and you'll we'll get there but for this particular situation it does to me appear to be premeditated it doesn't seem like there would be a time where this was supposed to be a normal night out and Aaron just happened to have a firearm on him because we know he was carrying firearms all the time. But, you know, he just happened to have a firearm on him. This was something that went wrong or something happened while they were out. And then this turned ugly. Just to recap, the last text was sent from Odin Lloyd's phone. Stop me if I'm wrong, Stephanie, at 3.23 a.m. And it's believed by the prosecution that Odin Lloyd was shot and killed at approximately 3.25. Right? Yes. We're talking... Only a couple minutes later. Yeah. So what could have transpired between the time they picked him up to the two minutes that it took to get to this location? This was something that was planned out. It may explain why there was this incident at the gas station that didn't seem like a big deal at the time, but you had an individual, I believe it was Carlos Ortiz, who was trying to get out of the vehicle and Aaron just kept kind of pushing him back in. Like, no, it's fine. It's fine. You know, we're good. And so maybe they probably knew what was going to occur that night. There there clearly was a plan in place. So to me, it does seem like this was something where Aaron Hernandez and possibly the two other individuals orchestrated this night exactly the way it played out for this specific reason, and that was to kill Odin Lloyd. No, it was definitely premeditated. He rented the car. What did he have to rent a car for? He had cars. He rented the car ahead of time. In the days leading up to June 17th, he was texting Ernest Bo Wallace saying, like, I need you to be here in North Attleboro on this night. You know, I need you to be here. Like, make sure you're here. Like, it was very important that that Bo Wallace was there. And yeah, I think they were getting themselves hyped up at the gas station. You know, they got they had, they had some drinks, they smoked, dancing in the music, you know, thinking like we're gangster. We know exactly what we're what we're on our way to do. And then you can even see when they get home to Aaron's house, they like put in the code for the garage. And before the garage is even like raising, it's barely raised up. And Ernest Boas kind of po- pacing around, looking around, definitely nervous. And they sort of like scooch under that garage door before it's even all the way up. And then Aaron, this idiot, is just walking around his own damn home that has sur- surveillance cameras everywhere holding a gun like an idiot. Like, he put the cameras there. He knows they're there. What's he doing? I have no idea. He didn't even try to hide it. He thinks that no one's ever going to see that video, and I won't steal the thunder here. We know where that's going to go. I remember this part specifically with when it came to the camera system. We'll get there. But it's one of those things where Odin Lloyd, everyone speculated as to why he was killed. 
And I think that's where a lot of like you go on the rumor boards and all these things. And some people say it's because Odin had figured out that potentially Aaron was gay or was bisexual or there was something else there. He, you know, he was involved with uh, Mr. Bradley or someone else who Aaron thought he was associating with. Or as we said, said a few minutes ago in this episode, it could have been something as simple where Aaron had exposed Odin, Odin Lloyd to a life that Aaron did not want his fiance knowing about. And because of Odin's connection to his fiance's sister, he had to tie up that loose end before his whole other life at this flop house was discovered by Shannon and the fun was over. And then he was financially responsible for a child, uh, it, which would have been a lot of money. And it, and it seemed like something that he didn't want to do. So I don't think we ever find out what the motive was because Aaron never admitted to it, obviously. But that's the speculation around it where everyone kind of wonders the why. Because if it was premeditated, you would think that it would have been something pretty severe. But as you've kind of established over the, these last three episodes, Aaron didn't need much of a reason. It could be a look. It could be a step on his sneaker. It could just be uh, a vibe that he picked up from someone. That in and of itself was enough for him to act on it to the point where he would kill someone. So we, we're never going to have that answer. We're never going to have that answer. That's unfortunate. Nothing would justify it. But I'm sure Odin's family would love to know why. Yeah, but what's he telling these two other guys, Wallace and Ortiz, to make them be on board with this? Like, he can't just be like, oh, I think he might tell my fiance that I'm sleeping with other women. Like, is nah, that followers, enough? Man. Is that enough of a justification? Are they that loyal? Are they that indebted to him? Are they that insistent on keeping this lifestyle that they've now developed by being in affiliation with him that they're just going to kill an innocent guy so he doesn't, you know, expose some secret? Like, I guess so. I could tell you one thing he didn't tell him. He didn't tell him, hey, man, I think he figured out that I'm bisexual. So I got to take him out. I can tell you that wasn't the excuse. So it probably was something where Aaron, you know, exaggerated, you know, listen, I saw him at the club the other night. He was talking to some dudes in the corner who I, I believe know so-and-so. This dude's going to stab me or shoot me in the back when I'm not looking. I got to get him before he gets me or before he he snitches out where I'm laying and his boys come get me. I got to take him out. I got I to gotta put out this flame right now. I need your guys' help. This is about safety. you know. So I, I'm, I'm assuming that's probably the narrative he was portraying. Yeah, if, if not exaggerated, outright lied gave them something like I have concrete. Yeah, I have concrete proof that he's like about to, to stab me in the back. So we got to get the jump. And let's be honest about this whole situation. This guy was a professional athlete, but not only professional athlete, a, a, a famous football player. He was one of the best in the league. Everyone wanted to be him. Everyone wanted to be friends with him. So you have these followers out there that want to be associated with Aaron Hernandez. So it doesn't take much for him to convince them to be his little minions. You know, hey, listen, you're coming with me. You're down with me. You're down with this. And they want to be like, they like the lifestyle. So they're going to be his lackeys. They're going to do what he asked them to do. And it's unfortunate that someone would be involved with that just to be around a celebrity. But you and I both know that's that's a reality for, for a lot of people out there who just want to be groupies. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, these guys were kind of already hardened criminals. They were all messed up on drugs and, and alcohol, too. So it, w it wouldn't take much, honestly, to just no. they were already shipping guns to him across state lines and like vehicles. What This is just what? And the next step. That's right. On June 17th, Aaron had a cleaning crew come to his house. And that afternoon, he, Ernest Wallace and Carlos Ortiz drove to Enterprise to return the rented Nissan Altima. Now, while there... Aaron apologetically informed the branch manager, Keila Smith, that the Altima had been damaged while in his possession. The side mirror had been broken, and there was a dent in the driver's side door, and he said he didn't know how the damage had happened. I'm sure that damage happened because while they're driving this car, Aaron's like going through toll booths, they're drunk, they're high. They probably banged off a couple of things and, you know, hit a couple of things. Honestly, that's probably what happened. Keela Smith said she could tell Aaron was lying, but it didn't really matter because he had full coverage on the vehicle. He also offered her a piece of gum, blue bubblicious gum to be specific. Smith exchanged the damaged Nissan out for a Chrysler 300 and the three men drove away. Odin Lloyd's body was discovered by a young runner just as Aaron Hernandez was headed to Enterprise to get rid of the Nissan. And when the police arrived, they found that Odin had a set of car keys in his pocket. Those car keys brought the police to an Enterprise rent-a-car 
And when they inquired about who had rented the black suburban that Odin had been seen riding around in, they found out that it was Aaron Hernandez. They also went through Odin's cell phone and discovered the text that he had exchanged with both Aaron Hernandez and his sister. But of course, the first thing on the minds of these police officers is not that, you know, this Patriots football player Aaron Hernandez killed their victim. They actually wondered if maybe something bad had happened to Aaron as well. That evening, they drove to his house, and they were further worried about Aaron when they got no answer after knocking on his front door and ringing the doorbell. Police went to the home of Aaron's next-door neighbor, who ended up being a man named Joe Judge, who was the special teams coach for the Patriots. Judge told law enforcement that he had not seen Aaron since practice on June 13th, and he offered to call the team's head of security. So the cops were like, okay, we'll wait while you do that. Now, Aaron was home, but he was laying low while he called his manager, Brian Murphy, to ask what he should do. He's like, listen, the police are outside, man. They're ringing my doorbell. What should I do? And Murphy inquired if Aaron had done anything wrong. And Aaron was like, no, I haven't done anything wrong. So Murphy was like, I don't understand why you won't just go answer the door then. You know, like if you didn't do anything wrong, just go outside and see what the police want. Aaron did walk outside where Massachusetts State Trooper Michael Shervin and Detective Daniel Arigi were waiting in their vehicle for a response from the Patriots head of security. When they saw Aaron walking down the driveway towards them, They got out of the car, introduced themselves, and asked him about Odin Lloyd. Aaron said he had rented a black Chevy Suburban for Odin. He and Odin were friends, their girlfriends were sisters, and he knew that Odin lived in Boston, but he wasn't sure of his exact address, although he did have it in his GPS. And then Aaron got sort of intense. Detective Arigi told the Sun Chronicle, quote, We started to ask him a few questions. He was polite at first. We asked him about Odin Lloyd, and it was like he flipped a switch. He said, I'm contacting my lawyer, end quote. According to Arigi and Charvin, Aaron walked back inside and returned with a business card that showed the name of a law firm in Boston, Ropes and Gray. Arigi told Aaron that they were investigating a death, and he was surprised when Aaron did not ask for more information. He didn't ask whose death they were investigating. Instead, he slammed the door in their faces and they heard the door lock. Both cops looked at each other and silently agreed that this was not really the behavior of someone who was innocent. Now, Aaron did come back out of the house later, after he had spoken to his lawyer, and he told the law enforcement officials that he would follow them to the police station to talk, and he did, leaving the house with Shayana and little AVL as the little caravan made its way to the North Attleboro police station. Shanna dropped Aaron off at the entrance to the police station, and then she tried to leave, you know, allegedly to go back home. But state trooper Shervin pulled her over before she could get far and approached her vehicle. And they started questioning her. They were like, you know, Odin Lloyd, like, do you know what happened to him? When Shervin told her that Odin Lloyd was dead, he claimed Shayana began to cry. Shayana explained that she did not know Odin Lloyd that well yet, but she knew he smoked weed and he probably sold it too. She claimed that she and Aaron had been home all day on Sunday, but he was not there when she had gone to bed. As she was going over this timeline with the police, Shanna's cell phone rang. It was Aaron telling her not to talk to the police on advice from his agent, Brian Murphy. After leaving the police station, cell phone records indicate that Shanna's phone traveled to Franklin, then to an ATM in Plainville, where she withdrew $500, then to another ATM in Coventry, Rhode Island, where she withdrew an additional $500. After this, Shanna drove to McDonald's in Rhode Island, where she met with Ernest Bo Wallace and Carlos Ortiz to give them this money, at which point she returned to North Attleboro. At the police station, Aaron casually entered an interview room, but he um, he had some requests, so he said his back hurt and he wanted the lights shut off. Detective Arigi said, quote, he shut the lights off, laid on the floor, and put his feet up on a chair. He plugged his phone in, and we had a small talk. Talked about sports. We couldn't ask him any questions because he asked for his lawyer, end quote. Thirty minutes later, Michael Fee and Robert Jones arrived to join Aaron in the interview room, and these were two lawyers from the Boston law firm Ropes and Gray. The two attorneys did not allow their client to be questioned. Instead, they stated, that uh, if he was not under arrest, they were going to be leaving with him, which they did. 
Now, Michael Fee would later tell the district attorney that Aaron was tired. He was not dressed properly for a video recorded police interview, and he wanted more time to talk to Aaron before Aaron spoke to the police. Now, at this point, when they leave the police station, Detective Mike Elliott decided to go into the dispatcher's room and watch Aaron and his lawyers on an exterior security camera. The three men stood outside and talked for 45 minutes before walking to a car in the parking lot where Aaron got into the driver's side. With the glow from the car's interior light, Detective Elliott could see Aaron remove the battery from his cell phone, at which point one of the attorneys removed another cell phone from his briefcase and handed it to Aaron. So what's your take on that? Um, well, I mean, I think that the reasons that Aaron didn't want to be interviewed that night were ridiculous. Like, he's not dressed properly for a videotaped interview. You know, obviously the lawyers want him to get his story straight so he doesn't say something that incriminates him. As far as the cell mm. phone swap, um, I'm I'm not sure what to think about that as because I think that for a lawyer to do that, to be involved in something like that is a little um it doesn't seem right. Unethical? Yeah. Right? It doesn't yeah. seem right. A little unethical. I think it's exactly what it sounds like where Aaron, who was already very uh skeptical of phones Remove the battery from his phone so it, you know, wouldn't be traced any further. If there was a tracking device on it, it wouldn't, you know, pick up any sounds or anything going on. The other phone was a burner phone, and that was to make calls to probably people like the two uh, accomplices from the night before, and also possibly to Cheyenne because you have to assume, unless they're capable of telekinesis, there would be no way for Cheyenne to know to go to grab five hundred dollars from two different banks. And then where to deliver that money to these two individuals uh, and their names again, Carlos Ortiz and Ernest Bo Wallace. So why would she bring the money to them? Who would have instructed her to do that? Would that be just something she thought of? And how was that information relayed to her? My guess, through a phone call. What phone? You guys put two and two together. Well, Aaron also could have told her to do this on the way to the police station, right? Because why is he having his fiance and his baby drop him off at the police station. Well, clearly because she's going someplace after that. She's not staying home. So he was probably like, let's go. You go from here. But yes, now he needs a phone to start making other moves, to start making other plans, to start checking in with his accomplices to be like, okay, are we good? You got the money? Like, are we on the same page here? Our stories are are correct. Right. We got to have the same story. Because look at it, look at it from an investigatory perspective, right? When we're developing a case, we have to find probable cause to get a search warrant for a house, a phone, whatever it may be. So it wouldn't be very hard to get a, a search warrant for Aaron Hernandez's phone, which is registered to him or his fiance, whatever it may be. You could articulate that, have a judge say, yeah, you got access to the phone, go pull his records. But how do you get records for a phone you don't know about? How do you get records for a phone that you've only seen on a camera? You don't know the number. That phone could have been given to Aaron and taken back to the lawyer and thrown in a swamp. We don't know. So how do you obtain the records for that phone? You don't. You would have to ultimately find the people on the other end of that conversation and cross, you know, cross examine the phones and find out where the common phone number is and see if it belongs to one. Was it a burner phone? Is it something Did it belong to one of the lawyers? You would have to basically compare the cell phone records from other people involved. That would be obviously Carlos and Ernest and Cheyenne and whoever else to see if there's a consistent number on all three phones that's not identified. But it'd be extremely difficult. And that's why you would do this, because it's another number that you have to find probable cause for to get a search warrant. And that's not always the easiest thing to do. So that would be the reason for doing it. Uh, not a bad idea, but you might want to do it when you're not on a CCTV in the police parking lot. That might be a good idea. And the police did ask uh, Robert Fee, I believe his name was one of Aaron's attorneys, like, could we see Aaron's phone that same night? And Fee was like, no, you can't. So. And to be fair, we're really hard on lawyers. And, you know, I have my opinions on it. I don't hide those opinions. I think there's a fine line between representing someone and giving them a uh, a defense before they're, you know, accused of a crime or, or, or convicted of a crime. But as you kind of alluded to earlier, there is a fine line there. And it, and it can go from doing your job to essentially becoming an accomplice or a facilitating a situation that would prevent law enforcement from doing their job. And to me, that's wrong. So 
we can go back and forth on this, and I'm sure there's been a lot of speculation about it. And if they had something tangible, the law enforcement, I mean, to prove that these lawyers facilitated things that impeded their investigation, they could have been charged with obstruction of justice as well. And I don't believe they were. So there probably wasn't anything that they could stick to them. So again, it's that gray area, right? And I'm sure there's going to be defense attorneys in our comments who say, you know, everyone's entitled to a lawful defense. We agree. We're with you. But where do you draw that line? How far do you go to protect your client? That's the real question. And I'm not a lawyer, so I guess I can't answer that. But I do think some of it is pretty commonsensical. I don't think you should be providing phones uh, for your client that may impede law enforcement's ability to do their job. That's just my opinion. Not only that, but it feels like, okay, here's a phone that can't be traced so you can continue to like do your illegal activity or like get your cover straight. You know, like we don't want them to know what you're doing. So here's a new phone. It does feel very much like, you know, protecting and and being an accomplice to that. And, you know, Aaron Aaron Hernandez is a high profile client, right? He's somebody that's going to bring in the big bucks. And uh, and they bent over backwards to protect him. But I don't think that it is ethical. And I think that I, it makes me uncomfortable. And, I, and I, I would believe that if the law enforcement asked about this thing that they saw on camera, because he law, you know, it's under, you know, it's a public camera. He's allowed to watch it. I don't I'm sure they asked about it. But if they did, I, I would believe that would fall under attorney client privilege. Right. I mean, that's what I would think. Yeah, absolutely. They would come. They would find some loophole, some gray area to to make that seem okay. Yeah, can't talk about yeah. it. Yeah. Interesting. So Odin's mother, Ursula, and Odin's girlfriend, Shania, were both informed of his death. And the first place that Shania went for comfort when she got the call on the morning of June 18th was straight to the arms of her big sister, Shayana. Shania testified that after crying for several hours, she fell asleep on the couch in Shayana's living room. And at around 8 a.m., Aaron Hernandez came home and he had words of comfort for her as well. He told her, quote, I've been through this death thing before. It will get better in time. End quote. The audacity, man. The audacity. Like, not even knowing that he was the person who did it, but to, to say that to somebody the day that they find out, like, their boyfriend is dead, like, it'll get better in time. That's not something you say the same day that that someone finds out that someone they love is dead. I've been through this death thing before. It'll get better in time. It's so callous. It's so not human. And it shows, I think, that Aaron not only had the audacity to even speak to Shania about Odin Lloyd's death, but the fact that he says it so flippantly and like, eh, you'll get over it in time. This will get better. Like, don't worry about it. It just shows how little he values human life. Very disrespectful. But at that time, I don't think he's thinking about Odin or or Shania. He's thinking about himself. I got to put on this front. I got to make it seem like I care. And he's just so disconnected from how he should be reacting that he probably thought he did a pretty good job. But in reality, it was very heartless, very cold, very unempathetic to her situation. Yeah, it's dismissive to like a huge loss, right? And he thinks he nailed it. He's like, oh, I am so comforting. And everyone else is over here like, what this is like, what are you, a robot? Like, she just found out this morning. What are you talking about? You know, but he's over here thinking this is how human beings talk to each other. But Shania would later testify that even her older sister's behavior was odd. Um, especially in those early days. She said that Shayana was acting secretive. She kept receiving all these phone calls and and then on the phone calls, she would just like give these one word answers. So somebody would be talking on the phone for quite a bit and then Shayana would answer like, yes, or like, got it. You know, very one word answers. Like she didn't want anyone to know what she was talking about. And Shayana went into the basement two or three times with this black garbage bag folded in her hands. She also went into the backyard with this garbage bag, but returned empty handed. Shiana also asked her younger sister if she could borrow her car to go to the bank to get money out to pay the housekeepers. And she was gone for about a half an hour. Shania testified that her sister had never asked to borrow her car before, and she'd felt that the timing was odd as it was the day after her boyfriend's dead body had been found. But at the time, she didn't think too much about it. Now, at this point, the police had come to the conclusion that they were going to need to stop viewing Aaron as a professional football player that many of them looked up to. 
and understand that he was potentially connected to the murder of Odin Lloyd. Aaron was the only person that Odin knew in North Attleboro. Lloyd was dating the sister of Aaron's fiance. Aaron had been communicating with Lloyd in the hours before his death. Odin Lloyd had a set of keys in his pocket that tied directly to Aaron Hernandez, and Odin's body had been found less than half a mile from the sprawling mansion where Aaron lived with his fiance and infant daughter. And when law enforcement began to collect and process the evidence, Aaron's connection to Odin's murder became more and more obvious. And that is where we will end today's episode and we'll pick up next week. Yeah. And just to tie in the significance of Shania taking that car after going downstairs in the video, I don't know if we discussed it, that final video where you see Aaron holding the gun, he does respond to the basement. And when he comes back up from the basement, he no longer has the firearm. So it leaves a reasonable person to believe that whatever he did, the firearm was left down in the basement. There wasn't a lot of time before police responded to the house, so he may not have had an opportunity to dispose of the firearm. So it's believed by many, and I believe it was presented this way in court, that Shania went downstairs, retrieved the firearm out, you know, based on Aaron's instructions, and then dumped that firearm at a different location. I think you're going to go into that next episode, so I won't go there, but they have some some opinions on where that firearm was dumped and why it wasn't able to be recovered. Really fascinating stuff. Yeah, they've got some compelling evidence to illustrate that that's exactly what happened. They got text messages, they got cell phone data, they got yeah. all sorts of stuff. Um, and like I said, you know, Shayana Jenkins is that kind of stand by your man girl that personally, this is just my opinion, I can't stand. I can't stand. I love the loyalty. I love the, you know, I've got your back. It's it's us together against the world. But when you're talking about murder and my husband got mad at me, we had this conversation a couple months ago and he was like, if I killed somebody, would you like tell on me? And I was like, if someone asked me and I knew, yeah, I would. And he's like, are you serious? And he was stunned. And I'm like, yes. Like, is it an innocent person? Is it like somebody who attacked you? He's like, what if it was self-defense? I was like, if it was self-defense, we tell the police it was self-defense. Like, no, I'm not going to just carry somebody's life that you took with me and be responsible for that secret and that person's family not getting justice. Like, I don't care who you are. And and he kind of got upset. He was like stunned about it. But I'm not that stand by your man kind of lady. Like, if you're ta- if you take life, if you take somebody's son somebody's father, somebody's loved one. I have a problem with it and and I'm not going to I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to cover for you. And she I believe did. And I think she knew a lot more than she's ever let on. So just so you guys know, Stephanie draws the line at murder. That's it. That's where she that's where she that's where you lose her. Um <laughs> real quickly, I don't want to make this super I don't want to make this a super long conversation. We do read the comments on both social and YouTube, not every single one, but we read a lot of them. And there have been a few comments that have addressed the, you know, why we haven't discussed uh, CTE as a factor in Aaron Hernandez's decision making process. Let me tell you this, Stephanie and I, although she doesn't tell me all the case, we've discussed and talked about the CTE element of this case extensively. But as you guys know, by this point, if you've been with us for a while, maybe these people haven't. We break it down chronologically. So one, we're absolutely going to discuss the CTE diagnosis of Aaron Hernandez and how it may have impacted his decision-making process, but we're not going out of order here. So for the people who are saying you're not covering this correctly because you're not- Nobody said that. Nobody said that, did they? Nobody said you're not covering it correctly because you haven't talked to- We're not even close to that yet. Why you're not discussing the CTE element of this? We are going to. It wasn't an extensive amount of people, but I did see a few comments. But understand, there's a lot to this case, and if you know anything about us, it's gonna. We're gonna go all the way, so we're gonna get there. But this was more after the fact when the CTE stuff started coming up after Aaron was deceased, and they had a chance to do the examination. So we'll get there. We're not trying to, you know, skew the narrative one way or the other. We will cover all bases as we always do, and let you guys decide what you think. Just wanted to put that out there because we now are in part three. We have not really discussed CTE and it's not because we're avoiding it. It's just because we're not there yet. We're definitely going to talk about CTE. I find it incredibly interesting, um, incredibly interesting. 
But obviously, that doesn't even come out or come to the public knowledge until after Aaron Hernandez is deceased. So we're not even close to that place in the timeline yet. And we're not even close to like the theories portion, which kind of sort of comes at the end. And that's when that's going to be be brought in. And we will discuss it extensively. I've already done a lot of research on it and it will be there. But yeah, I, I can't believe that people really said we weren't covering it correctly because of that. There were people. That's offensive. Yeah. If you have a chance, watch the movie Concussion, guys. Great movie. Will Smith really breaks down CTE as well. It doesn't discuss Aaron Hernandez, but breaks down the effects of it, how it was originally discovered and how it ultimately became what it's known as today. But just something to maybe use as reference material if you want to watch a good movie and get an understanding of what CTE is if you don't already know. Anything else? We're over we're over 2 hours here. I think I did touch on it a little bit when I said, you know, I can't believe the toll that that playing football takes on these kids cuz they're so young and then their bodies are just completely destroyed, their bodies, their brains like they have the body and brain of like an, a very elderly person by the time they're done with their short NFL career. And it was like, is it worth it? You know, is it worth it, especially for the majority of them who don't make it to the NFL like Aaron Hernandez did and who aren't making the money that Aaron Hernandez was making? And honestly, I think even with the money that he was making, it's not worth it to do that to your body and your brain. Like you only get one of those. So that's just my opinion. But we'll, well get at there. At the time, they didn't really... At the time with Aaron, they weren't really familiar with CTE. There wasn't really a thing. It was after Aaron that it really started becoming prevalent, you know, because there was some, I shouldn't say they weren't, it was something that wasn't being discussed publicly exactly. by the NFL. It was something that they, <laughs> and this is why Concussion is a great movie for you guys to go watch because it really dives into that. Dr. Sarah Wecht, who's one of the best uh, forensic pathologists in the world, in my opinion, uh, is a big part in that whole case and in that movie. And uh, the actor that plays him, I don't know who it is, does a great job with it, but Cyril is someone who I I look up to and has been extremely influential in the cases that I've worked. So you should definitely check it out. Plus Will Smith. I mean, he's had some, he's had a rocky road lately, lately but he's still, you know, a good actor. Yeah. He doesn't slap anybody in the movie. No. <laughs> that I know of. Is he the one getting the concussion? No, he's the doctor that discovers it. Who's the player that this is about, this movie? It's a few players. Uh a few Pittsburgh Steeler players because this was in this was in uh, Pennsylvania, I believe, where this this doctor worked. Um, I don't remember the names of the uh, the football players that involved, but it was a couple in the movie where they started to see case after case where these NFL players were committing acts of violence or killing themselves or killing someone else, and they started to kind of put it together. It's a long story, but you should definitely check it out. Great, great movie. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to watch it. Actually, I just looked it up. Um, yeah, it wasn't being spoken about publicly until Aaron Hernandez because it was so high profile. But like, don't don't make yourself feel like that wasn't very well known in uh, in, you know, the football circles. And I mean, even in the documentary, they talked about a couple of players who had kind of gone through that and really had some tough times. So people knew they just didn't care because these these boys, these men, they're assets. They make money and they bring people into the stands. And you really have to ask yourself, like, is it worth it? I do. I know you love football, but I have to ask myself, is it worth it? I get it. I totally get it. Well, we appreciate it, guys. It's over over two hours for this one. Who knows what it'll be after the edit, but we appreciate you coming in, checking us out. As we had said, it's gonna be we got a few more parts left on this one. We really want to cover everything. It's a fascinating case. Uh, and so weigh in, in the comments. Let us know what you're thinking now that we've kind of gotten to the point where we're getting to the why we're here and how ultimately Aaron Hernandez was um, brought into the light of law enforcement because up until this point he's kind of gone unscathed Odin Lloyd is where that changed so this is where it's going to really start getting heavy when we get into the evidence and how they connected all this as it's going to trial uh, as far as our socials we got a lot of them I won't say them all they're down in the comments you can see all the websites the only one I'll tell you is because it's our new baby criminalcoffeeco.com. If you haven't checked it out yet, go check it out. That's our new coffee company, Criminal Coffee Company. Check it out. See the story. See the universe that we've created for you guys. See the coffees themselves and, and check them out. And if you want to give it a shot, uh, that's where you'll order it. Anything else, Stephanie? No, I think we're good. Thank you guys so much for being here. We'll see you next week. All right. Bye. Be safe. Bye. Bye.